Shh. Hey, chat. Hey, chat. Hey, chat. Shh. Do you hear that? Do you do you hear that? It, it's the sound of a really, really good game that I'm really, really addicted to. That's what the sound is. Yeah. Do you, do you hear it? I don't. I don't know about you guys, but I, I hear it. Damn. The sound of a beautiful game. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everybody! <laughs> Ugh, good morning. I... love this game. I might be playing this every day until it's done at this point, because it's really hard to put down this game. Ah, I feel like that that's a bad thing, but I don't care in the slightest. Ah, good morning, everybody! Welcome to the stream! Welcome to my addiction. I hope you guys don't mind it. Because you don't get a choice or say in the matter. I'm just going to keep playing this game. Right now, we have the Crystal Tower trial ready to begin. It's going to be a spicy one. We got some more Beric Von Zeke's action. Which I'm excited about. <laughs> Which I'm excited about. We got a mysterious hooded figure apprentice now. I'm still not saying anything on that. I have a very good theory on that. But I want to wait a little longer before I say anything about that mystery uh, hooded figure. And... What else happened yesterday? Ah yes, we found the collar. That I'm presuming is the uh, Hound of the Baskervilles collar that is soaked in blood. Ooh. Ooh hoo hoo. Lots of spicy stuff. It's all coming together. Oh yeah. It's all coming together. <laughs> so. So much spicy shit. And we are starting the trial of the third episode. I have a feeling it's going to be a very long one. I don't know how long today's stream is going to be, but I do, at the very least, want to finish this episode, so... Who knows? This might be 12 hours. Who actually knows? Yes, we finished episode 2 yesterday, and then we started the investigation part of uh, episode 3, so now we're just going right into the trial! But I hope you guys are doing well. It's really good to see you. <laughs> and thank you for uh, coming to watch my addiction. I, it, it means a lot. I really like this game a lot. It's really great. <laughs> but it's so bad. And yes, oh my god, the more Shelm's vest, the better. I don't. I have a feeling we're not going to see his vest for a while. We got a trial to run, so it's going to be a bit before we see... Actually, I don't even know if we're going to see Shelm's much today at all. Who knows? He doesn't show up in court much. When he does, it's always a nice surprise, but I, I just uh, I don't feel like it's going to happen, you know? I don't know. Uh. Oh yes, we also did get to see an Iris new outfit. That that is correct. That is correct. She wore it to the 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 Crystal Tower, to the Great Exhibition. That did happen. All right, trial part one. Let's start this without any more delay. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. It's gonna be spicy. And I'm getting more and more addicted to Mr. Von Zeeks. <sighs> Alright, 8.52 a.m. on October 23rd. <sighs> I can't believe it's been six months since I was last allowed to work in court. We're gonna be rusty! We're gonna be rusty, man! And now, here I am, back at the old Bailey. Ah, Mr. Mr. Naruto! Good morning, Professor Harebrain! I don't understand! I don't, it doesn't make any sense! The atmospheric pressure in here is off the charts! I've never done- I've never felt anything like it! It's crushing me! I feel it every time I'm here, that gravity. Well, this is British highest court. Britain's highest court. But are you telling me it's fitted with some kind of device that can actually control air pressure? <laughs> no. 
I think it's probably all in the mind. <laughs> ah, yes, well, you won't let me down, will you, Mr. Naruto? I'm counting on you in today's trial to save my life! To save the secret of my super high voltage instantaneous kinesis machine from being made public! Ah, yes, I understand. I know what I have to do. I have to establish that the explosion two days ago was nothing more than an unfortunate accident. Nothing more. <sighs> well, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about, really. Justice will prevail. Uh, <clears throat> my commiserations, Mr. Naruto. You seem to have been lumbered with the most tiresome case here. Is this Sholmes? Of course it's Sholmes. Okay. Mr. Sholmes! <laughs> I didn't expect to see you here. That was very mean, Runo, leaving me all alone at home with Hurley. <laughs> Took me at least an hour to wake him. Is Sholm still having sleeping problems? The scientific experiment of oversleeping. Yes, of course. How could I forget? Oh, uh, is it? Are you? Herlock Sholmes? Indeed, sir. I am he. Herlock Sholmes! <laughs> oh, I've heard all about your exploits, even whilst living in Germany! I am he, yes. He's very proud of that, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Ranst Magazine is on sale in Germany, too. This month's installment was sublime. Your deduction in the adventure of Silver Blaze was wonderful. Ah, uh, yes. A memorable case, indeed. It concerned a snake, I seem to recall. Wait, what? No, that was the speckled band. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for coming. <laughs> I do appreciate your support. I'm sorry to disappoint you, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid I can't stay. Of course you can't. This man cannot just sit in a courtroom. I think he would rather die or sleep. I have urgent business at Madame Tuspel's. Oh, you mean your waxwork job. Oh, right. Oh, no, no, the waxwork abduction, of course. Madame has, enga Madame has engaged my services. Ah, so you're trying to get to the bottom of that ransom note, are you? The week's wages depend on it, as does the safe return of the waxwork, naturally. As such, I intend to give it my undivided attention. Ah, well, never mind then, I understand. Of course, with my skills of observation and reasoning, resolving the matter will be as easy as proverbial pie. What? I, I shall return forthwith. For until I solve the case, I shall have no money to afford a pie of any description. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know he was broke ass poor. Good to know. Oh, I should have expected that, honestly. Then you must absolutely give it your full attention, Hurley! Quite, Iris, quite. My life is riddled with irony, you know? Hey, he's self-aware, that's important. Whenever I give something my full attention, I have quite insatiable desire for pie. Uh, one of the universe's intractable mysteries, you might say. What? I'm so confused. Ah, oh, yes, quite, definitely, absolutely, I totally understand. Is someone a little starstruck? Oh my god, no! <laughs> Don't feed into Sholmes' ego, please. I wish you the very best of luck, Professor Hairbrain. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, uh, why, thank you. Before I depart, Mr. Naruto, a word in your ear, if you please. A word in your ear? Oh god. What's this about? Oh no, the music. Oh no, the music is gone. Wait, Sholmes is actually being serious. Oh shit. As you have remarkably little grounding- remarkably little grounding in science, I feel I ought to inform you. As compelling as this super high voltage instantaneous kinesis hypothesis may be, a practical implementation such as was attempted by the professor at the Great Exhibition is quite impossible. What? Wait, Sholmes, what are you suggesting? But the professor said the demonstration was a success. Ah, yes, it would appear that he fervently believes that it was. 
I've read Professor Bunnybrain's paper about it too, Runo, and I have to say... I'm sure it can't be done. It could barely be done theoretically, let alone practically. So he's completely barking up the wrong tree? But how could an experiment that had no possibility of succeeding, in fact, succeed? That's contradictory. And it's that contradiction that will be at the heart of the trial, I've no doubt. What's that supposed to mean? Now, I must hurry along. I wish you the best of luck, dear fellow. See you later, Hurley! Wait, Sholmes! No! If you know I'm batshit dumb in science, you should stay and help me! God damn it! Ah! No, instead he had to make everything ten times more complicated! What a bitch! Hmm. It looks like you're on your own today, Yuruno, but chin up, you can do it! Oh, what about you, Iris? Oh no, I'm afraid I can't help. I have something I need to do. But Oh my god, I'm 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 doing a trial. My first trial for the first time in six months. So I'm not only am I rusty as heck, I'm being I'm being the defense in a case about science that I know nothing about. I don't know jack shit about science, and both of my scientific friends just ditched me! What am I gonna do? How do we win this? Do I look like a scientist? No! I'm afraid I can't help. I have something I need to do. I see. It's going to be a big surprise for you when you find out what it is. It better be a fucking great surprise. You're screwing me over here, child. I like that I'm relying on a 10-year-old child for scientific help. This is great. That sounds ominous. Hmm. <clears throat> Counsel for the defense and the defendant. Court is about to begin in session. Make your way into the courtroom at once. Be on our way. You know what? You know what? Ver Beric von Zeeks might not know anything about science either, so you know what? This might be fine. An experiment that the laws of science can't, uh, that the laws of science say can't possibly succeed. And a scientist who's convinced that it did. That's the riddle you have to unlock here, Ryanosuke. That's the key to this case. I feel screwed. Like, the most screwed I've ever felt. In any trial so far. This is gonna be a doozy. Me versus Von Zeeks. 1v1. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. We are sitting today for the public trial of Prose Professor Albert Hairbrain. I now call upon the counsels for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is... The defense is ready, my lord! I know, she's ten. She's still ten. I am six months out of practice, and what's more... Oh, Susato's gone. I'm without Susato-san today. Uh, is it just my imagination, or does the air in here feel even more oppressive than usual? Oh boy, we're fucked. We're fucked, guys. I must say, I recollect the victim of this case all too well, Mr. Odie Asman. Mr. Asmin was well known as a financier, though that was merely a front for his diverse criminal activities. It was only a month ago that the man appeared in court prosecuted by you, Lord Van Zeeks. But the jury unanimously found him not guilty. Because every member of the jury had been bribed by the sound of it. These powerful London criminals are prepared to go to extreme lengths to keep their freedom. But two days ago, on 21st of October, Mr. Asmin met, met his end. The work of the Reaper, was it? If that is how your lordship would describe divine retribution. But the fact remains that Mr. Asmin's death was a di direct result of the actions of the accused, Professor Hairbrain. Very well, then. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected at random, totally, to represent the will of the people, totally. Are the six of you ready to fulfill your societal duties? Totally. Oh, new people! I'm most gratified to have been selected to carry out this important civic duty, my lord. Whoa! We're getting all different kinds of people here. To have a man's fate in the palm of one's hand. Oh gosh, oh golly. It sends shivers down my spine. Science experiments, magic, conjuring tricks, courtroom trials are nothing more than performances. Any spurious scholar that defiles the reputation of science deserves to hang. Holy shit. We have to listen to what side on both sides. The fence and uh, the, the settle on one. That's it, isn't it? Wait, that's the guy from Madame Tuspells. Oh, and he's got a gun. Wasn't like this in my day. Wasn't like this at all. That's... That's the police killer otter mole look-alike again. And he's as exhausted as ever, it seems. You know, on the bright side, at least we got all new jurors. As I'm sure you are all well aware, the incident we are here to judge today tragically took place at the Great Exhibition shortly after its opening. Though the death toll could have been far worse, with the exception of the victim, no one was killed. Nevertheless, the dream of the science being exhibited rapidly turned into a nightmare for the spectators. A tragic turn of events, and as such, the eyes of all London, no, of the whole world, will be on this trial. It is our duty to reach a swift and just conclusion, I feel. Your opening statement, please, Lord Van Zeeks. At the heart of this incident is technology never before demonstrated anywhere in the world. One of science's latest developments, I take it? The government is keen to capitalize on the Great Exhibition to improve Britain's technological advantage. The technology being demonstrated by the accused was described as super high voltage instantaneous kinesis. Good lord! It's designed to disassemble human subjects using extremely high voltage electricity and beam them instantly to another location where they are subsequently reassembled. Is such a thing even within the realms of possibility? I don't believe it, that's for sure. Disassembling people with electricity? My goodness, how shocking! The whole idea is absurd. The hypothesis will never stand up to scrutiny. Sir, I believe you are a fellow of the Royal Society. Are you not an expert in your field? Oh great, one of the jurors is a scientist. I am, and my word on the matter can be considered final. Instantaneous kinesis is poppycock. So this expert and Mr. Sholmes are in agreement. It's impossible. What is the prosecution's view on the matter? The prosecution would assert that the accused's instantaneous kinesis demonstration was its success. What? Van Zeeks? The professor's hypothesis is currently under investigation by the British government. If it is deemed to have merit, a substantial research grant would be made available. The accused made use of the invention built on his new hypothesis to take Mr. Asman's life. In order to be the sole benefactor of the grant. Uh, but... This disastrous demonstration was no accident. 
it was carefully designed from the outset to end the life of the victim. Hmm, okay. There we go. Thank you, Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution stance is clear. You will now bring forth witnesses to substantiate your claims. Gladly, my lord. Up, oh, rip the cape off. Hot mode activated! Bailiff, show the first witness, witness to the stand. Hot mode, let's go. Wait, Gregson is a witness? Oh, because he was there, right. Tobias Gregson, defective detective inspector at Scotland Yard's homicide division. I was on duty at the demonstration on the day in question and in charge of the fellow's investigation. Albert Havrain, scientist! You were born in England, but have been carrying out research in Germany in recent years, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. After graduating from university here in Britain, I went to work in Germany and made an amazing discovery. Which is what brought me back. I had to demonstrate my incredible hypothesis at the Great Exhibition. Well, you demonstrated was incredible, all right? An incredible explosion! But the science! The science was a success! The instantaneous kinesis worked! Everyone saw it! They must have done! There was... Yes, there was a terrible accident, but... The demonstration of my hypothesis was a success! Well, that much is undeniable, as shown in this photograph taken by the forensic investigation team. This was taken inside the Crystal Tower, I take it. This had a piece of the exhibition, no less. Oh, oh, we didn't make a prediction. Oh, 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 yes. Good point, chat. Good point. Um, Von Zeke's prediction time. Last trial, we got no legs. There is no way that we're not going to have any legs this time. So, I'm going to call two wine bottles. I'm gonna make it big. I think this is gonna be a big trial. Two wine bottles, 11 glasses will break upon this trial. And two legs. So, two wine bottles, 11 glasses, and two legs. That is what I'm saying for this trial. That's it. That's right, my lord. Seems the victim ran straight into it. Whew. Got it here in writing. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> I see. Very well. Submit the photograph as evidence. It shows an apparent stab wound to the chest. As the court heard, the victim of the incident was ODR's men. There have been a number of allegations made against the man, but putting them aside for the time being, he was the man who financed the research for their experiment and, demonstra and the demonstration itself. I see. So, to summarize this situation, the defendant is accused of taking the life of the man who funded his work. Would that be correct? Exactly. Couldn't it be that the explosion was caused by some malfunction in the apparatus used for the demonstration? That's right, that must be it. My splendid machine, my poor splendid machine. But now Sholm's got me thinking, like, if this is impossible, is this scientist innocent? I shouldn't def- oh, fuck. Uh, you gotta- okay, what, what did Cosma tell you, Crystal? You gotta fully believe in your client. No doubt. No doubt. You gotta you gotta believe in your client. That's a that's a defense lawyer's greatest asset. Don't doubt him. Even though I totally do. But no, I can't. That's right, that must be it. My splendid machine, my poor splendid machine. You saw it yesterday, didn't you? We can't examine the wreckage thanks to the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act. What? The 
wreckage! The wreckage! And that being the case, how can the facts be established? How can it possibly be determined whether this was an accident or deliberate and malicious attack? Extremely simply, my lord. Isn't that right, witness? Sorry? Me? Wait, no, your neighbor. Yes, sir, it was murder, plain and simple. Anyone could state that with complete certainty. What? How can he possibly think that? Thank you, Inspector. I think we had better proceed to formal testimony. You will explain to the court on what grounds you claim this experiment had been a front for murder. The corpse that went crashing through the Crystal Tower had a broken neck. I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all. That was my mistake. But the post-mortem examination revealed another injury, a fatal wound. There was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. So the victim was killed before he went anywhere, and this fella's the only one who could have done it. Huh. They're claiming a stabbing prior to the teleportation. Extraordinary business. In addition to suffering a broken neck, the victim was stabbed in the heart. Information I would really like to have heard from someone other than the judge. The coroner says death would have been an all but instant from a wound like that. You could say, in fact, that the victim was killed twice by the accused. No, 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 and no! This That couldn't be further from the truth! I have here the experiment plan document that was submitted to the security team. The victim stood himself inside something called the birdcage, ready to be beamed instantly. To the second level of the crystal tower, about 25 yards away. The experiment did not go according to plan, however. As the machine was put into operation, there was a large explosion. The blast caused the beam transmitter to point higher than intended. Accordingly, the kinesis resulted in the birdcage materializing in mid-air. Ow from where it subsequently fell, crashing through the glass of the Crystal Tower's large round window. My word, one assumes the victim's neck was broken upon impact with the tower, then. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen, the machine was just too powerful! So someone basically tampered with the machine. Honestly, really, I swear, it was just an accident, a, a terrible accident! Unfortunately, that excuse can't save you. Considering the sharp murder weapon that pierced the victim's heart. A murder weapon? What are you saying? This is the autopsy report submitted by the coroner. The prosecution would like it entered into the court record. Your request is granted, counsel. I was there in person, you know, I saw the whole ludicrous performance. And the only other person on the stage was Mr. Asman. With Mr. Asman was that disgraceful excuse for a scientist. Oh, then really, by all accounts, it must have been him. Ugh, hard to think otherwise, really. I, I... There's so many explanations for this. If someone, like, planted a bomb on the on the disc prior to when it actually happened all you need to do is like have a remote red button and you just push it at the same time and it explodes and then frame the guy you don't need to actually be there because we did see scratches on the back where the explosion happened 
Counsel for the defense, proceed with the cross-examination. I need to focus here. Oh, yep. It's been a while. Let's go. Whew. Hold on, before this starts, I got stuff to look at. Yeah, that's the tilt up. So this is our photograph of the victim. That is quite the stab. Okay, what is the autopsy report? Odie Asman, 47, British, 21st of October, around 2.20 p.m. Cause of death, hemorrhage of a wound to the chest that pierced the heart inflicted by a sharp implement. Additional observations, a broken vertebra, most likely resulting from impact after a sudden fall from considerable height. I'm so confused because I can get I can give a theory, but at the same time, this is supposed to be impossible according to Sholmes. I'm really taking his words to heart here. So is this scientist just really dumb? Is he just like innocently super dumb or it's weird? Okay. The corpse had a broken neck. I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all. That was my mistake. Hold it! So the angle of the projection is critical, is it? And you calculated it yourself personally? Absolutely! The calculation is far too complicated for anyone but me to carry out. Only you got it wrong, didn't you? Yes, that's right! That's the point! The calculation is so complicated, even I can make a mistake! Do people fall for that brazen confidence? I should try it. <laughs> and I took it into account the subject's height and weight. Height and weight. The wind direction, the ambient temperature. I considered every possible variable, so I just don't understand how this could have happened. Obviously, then, you had to include the weight of the clothes that Mr. Asman was wearing at the time, I suppose. Ah. Crackling comets, the answer should have been three! So much for safety first. The three must be for safety third. Oh. Hold it! Another fatal injury, you say? That doesn't make any sense. I didn't think I'd have to spell this out, but here we go. Just because there were two fatal wounds doesn't mean I'm saying the victim had two lives to lose, does it? Greg said! That's not what I'm saying! Obviously, at first we thought the bloke had died due to his spine snapping in half as well. But you're saying that's not the case? You'll get your answer once I finish my fish and chips. If you don't keep buttoning in every few seconds. We all know that's a bottomless bag. <laughs> the victim plummeted 30 feet into a glass tower. It would be reasonable to assume that as the cause of death. Right, that's what we all thought, but it was a red herring, wasn't it? Hold it! The defense knew nothing of this crucial information. The prosecution received this report from the forensic investigation team only this morning. That was the first we knew of it as well. I can only apologize for the impossibility of informing the defense. Sarcastic and insincere, thanks. So, what was the nature of this sharp object? Among the accused's tools that were in use at the demonstration, one is of particular interest. 
This. That would appear to be some kind of screwdriver, wouldn't it, Council? Ah! There he is! My trusty little companion, Andrew! Andrew! Of course. Ah, oh, do you know each other already? He's one of my dear friends like all my dolls! I've named them all, you know. We're one big happy family. Okay. Andrew is my flathead screwdriver, of course. His brother Michael is a crosshead. It would appear that your beloved Andrew has a red stain on its shank. That isn't... It's blood, beyond all reasonable doubt. No. I... I should maybe... I should... I have a lot of tools. I should... I should start naming them. One big happy family! And that's not all. The long sharp shape of this Andrew fellow is completely consistent with this victim's wound. What? I think Andrew might have a mind of his own. The court will enter this friend of the defendant as evidence. So, one of the Professor Harebrain's tools is the murder weapon? Great. Do I not get to see it? Okay. This is blood, Mr. Asmund's, no doubt. This is the problem with looking at murder weapons. I've seen this unusually shaped handle before. It's the same screwdriver that was lodged in the grill on the floor of the kinesis machine, which could be important information, so I should definitely make a note of it. killed before he went anywhere, and this fellow is the only one who could have done it. Hold it! I can't believe Andrew would kill a guy either. The fucking nerve. What grounds do you have for saying that? Do you really need to ask? There were only two people on that public experimentation stage in front of the whole crowd. The victim, Mr. Oldie Asman, and the accused, Professor Harebrain. And we know for certain that before the experiment, the, the victim was alive. That's right, I saw him with my own eyes! Furthermore, following the explosion and the kinesis, nobody went anywhere near the body. In other words, only someone else on stage with the victim could possibly have done it. Excuse me! Professor Hairbrain, do you have some information that might be relevant here? Sorry, sorry! I was just calculating the optimum coefficient of electrolysis to separate molecules in the human body. Ah, uh, and the witness stand is the best place for that? Seems as though you might have something to say about Inspector Gregson's last remark. Ah, yes, that's right, of course! He just said that nobody else could have done it, didn't he? Ah, uh, that's right. Who else could have stabbed the victim, eh? I don't know, but... There's no way that I could possibly have stabbed Mr. Asman, as you say. Eh? Explain, please, Professor. Of course, this cold-hearted policeman may not be aware, I suppose. 
But humans are warm-blooded mammals with blood running continuously through their veins, I had heard. Then surely you see, if I'd plunged something the size of Andrew into the man's chest, the whole stage would have been a bloodbath, no a blood swimming pool. Thousands of Londoners were watching me at the time. And yet not one of them claims I've seen a swimming pool of blood. Well, no, I suppose not. You see, not one! True, I didn't see anything like that. Well done, Professor. That was a great counter argument. Uh oh! Round number one has begun. Pray forgive the discourtesy if I savor a drop from my hello chalice to accompany my old friend's adducing. Alrighty, the game has begun! Van Zeeks has whipped out the wine. Here's to you, Albert. Oh, you're too kind, Barrack, but I'm really not a patch for you. Oh my god, that did not take long. He's already pissed. No, you're not. You've neglected to mention one crucial possibility. I have. A particular situation in which little bleeding would result from a stab wound. Of course. Inspector, enlighten the court, please. Where are they going with this? Very well, you will amend your formal testimony now, Inspector Gregson. The weapon the victim was stabbed with must have been left in his body whilst he was beamed through the air. But then that creates a inconsistency, buddy. Do you not see the picture? It's not like the murder weapon was, you know, here. Objection! Oh, I guess I'm not supposed to say that. Okay. Nah, that seemed to make sense to me, so I have no regrets. Alright, let's finish it off, though. Bum, 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 bum. I haven't been here for four months. Rest assured, we should be happy to carry proceedings forward in your absence, Council. He sounds serious! I have to prove my worth before he really does send me back home! Alright, let me finish. Let me wrap this up. So, that's all the testimony I have to work with. I had no idea the victim had been stabbed. That changes everything. Did Van Zeeks keep that to himself until now on purpose to gain the advantage? Oh well, I suppose all I can do is press these witnesses for as much new information as possible. Okay, okay. That's what they want me to do. Hold it! Are you suggesting that's because he fell from a considerable height? Exactly, which highlights something else about this whole rum business. What's that? The fact that the instantaneous kinesis itself was a success. After the explosion, the cage when the, with the fella inside suddenly appeared out of nowhere in midair. So although the experiment ended in disaster, the so-called instantaneous kinesis did actually occur. Remind us, Professor, what was the cause of the fatal disaster? Okay, we press that. Uh, I think we press everything from here. Oh! Hold it! Right. I'm stupid. Why would you think that, Inspector? With any wound, it's only when you pull the weapon out that profuse bleeding occurs. Whilst it's still lodged in the body, it acts as a stopper of sorts, for want of a better word. I see. You don't need a medical degree to be aware of this fact. It's common knowledge for any investigator. 
Where's Sasada san when you need her? If you ask me, this bloke masked what he was doing from view, from view with his body beat before stabbing, stabbing Asmin in the chest. Then he beamed the victim off the stage with his fancy device. The screwdriver's still where he planted it. I would never do such a thing. Not to my precious tools. I would never use them for such dirty work. You only use tools for their intended purposes. That's common knowledge for any scientist. The fact remains the lack of blood at the scene can easily be explained as the prosecution has demonstrated. Oops. I'm just seeing if I get anything new because the game seemingly wants me to keep pressing for more. Hold it! Even though we already did these. I'm not I'm not getting what they're putting down here. <laughs> Why do I like it when Von Zeke's, uh, does this? Every time he is a dick to me. Damn. This whole Andrew business. Oh, God. I wonder if we'll ever get to see Michael, the, the, the component that goes with Mr. Andrew the Screwdriver. Andrew would never. I think Andrew would, actually. Except Andrew would if somebody else was manning Andrew and not the professor. Somebody else is doing. As it so happens. All right, what am I doing? Uh, okay, let's go through each one. The corpse that went crashing through the crystal tower had a broken neck. Can't say anything about that. I made a minor miscalculation in the angle of the beam projection, that's all. That was my mistake. I can't really say anything against that either. The post-mortem examination revealed another injury, a fatal wound. Yeah. There was a lesion in his chest where he'd clearly been stabbed by something sharp right in the heart. Yeah. What if it was a crossbow? I still don't believe this. There's so much to this case I feel like that we don't know. I really feel like we just don't have enough information. So this flathead screwdriver is Andrew, and the crosshair one is Michael. We have to remember that. I'm sure that's very key and vital evidence, if you ask me. I wonder if the crossbow has a name. Boof, imagine getting stabbed. Let's name all the pieces of evidence. Uh, I mean, you're more than welcome to. Anyway, I need to focus. I'm not really focusing anymore. Whipped in, the weapon the victim was stabbed with must have been left in his body whilst he was beaming through the air. Uh, okay. I feel like I can say something against this. I'm just not sure what. Oh, wait. Um, how do I prove that, though? We found... Okay, wait, wait, wait. We found this screwdriver on the exhibition stage. If they're claiming that it was where he was teleported to, that would have been on the platform. The screwdriver wasn't found there. It was found on the platform. How do I... That makes sense. Okay, but how do I prove that? It 
was okay. We found <sighs> that was found poking through the grill in the base of what remains of the kinesis machine. They do specify in this report where it was found. It wasn't found on the platform where his body was. But I already did this. I already presented the screwdriver here. So it, it was wrong. The weapon the victim was stabbed with must have been, uh, must have been left in his body whilst he was beaten through the air. to me it has to be the screwdriver Objection. oh okay the music did go off maybe i just had to finish the pressing ah oh, whatever you say that while the weapon remains in the body there's very little bleeding is that unequivocal look there was no blood on the experimentation stage even though there was that's where the fellow was stabbed the only explanation for that is if the screwdriver was still in his body stopping any heavy bleeding it's common medical knowledge, my learned friend. Him, even your side of the world. Yes, but about this screwdriver... The thing is, we actually saw it at the scene ourselves, on the experimentation stage. What? It was on the floor by the wreckage of the machine, poking through a metal grill. I went to pick it up, but the detective here stopped me. Isn't that right, Inspector Gregson? Thank you, mods. Well, now that you mention it, uh, yes. Inspector, are we to understand that you permitted the defense counsel to investigate? That you contravened the special dispensi dispensation for scientific equipment act? No, no, not at all. I wouldn't do that. I just let him look, nothing more. I was very clear he wasn't to touch anything. Yes, that's true. The screwdriver was in plain sight on the stage. But it shouldn't have been, should it? What are you getting at? If this tool had been, still been in the victim's body when the victim was beamed away from the machine, then it shouldn't have still been on the stage. That's right, it should have been beamed across to the Crystal Tower along with Mr. Asman. And been found still lodged in the victim's chest. Take that, Gregson. How do you explain this, Inspector? Uh, well, uh, I, I don't. It looks as though everything that the victim had on his person moved with him when he was beamed. If the screwdriver was still in his chest when the instantaneous kinesis occurred, Obviously, that should have been beamed to the destination as well. This is a strange situation. Even though people are saying that this instantaneous kinesis is a scientific impossibility. We're still basing arguments on the assumption that it did actually take place. Alright, time to tighten the screws here. My lord! If the prosecution is unable to explain this inconsistency in its argument, we can only conclude that the testimony given in support cannot be relied upon. Van Zeeks is pissed, bro. Van Zeeks is stomped! Hold it! Holy shit! Do you have something to say, witness? Yes, I knew it. It bears out. The equations hold. Mr. Naruto, don't worry! About what? 
Without delving into the details, there is no inconsistency. What? Even if Andrew had been lodged in Mr. Asmund's chest, my trusty tool wouldn't have moved. Andrew remaining on the on the stage is consistent with my calculations. What? What? Sir. Oh my god, Van Zeke's already through a wine bottle! This trial just started! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> What's happening in this court? <laughs> oh god! What's happening? Why would he say that? Oh god! It would seem your illusions have been shattered. Clearly, we should have the accused explanation. Or should I say this brilliant scientist's explanation? Oh, Jesus, dude. Why? Why? Stop making my job hard! Where's Sholmes? God damn it. When I found an inconsistency in the prosecution's argument. Oh, uh, yeah. Honestly, true. That did deserve a bottle. I don't blame Van Zeeks. I probably would have done the same if I had a bottle. Like, fuck that. Very well. The defendant will testify again. Provide us with a scientific explanation as to why the inconsistency asserted by the defense fails to hold. In the name of Apollo, I will, my lord. Okay. Here we go again. To be clear, I'm still at the stage of gathering data in my research. My hypothesis states that Kinesis cannot transport metal, though. Hence, the metal weapon would have stayed put. In other words, the point just raised by Mr. Naruto isn't an inconsistency at all. Mr. Asman was the patron of my research. Without him, my work wouldn't well, have been possible. Hi, I'm Miles, thank you so much for the four month reset. We really appreciate all the support. Thank you so much. Now I have a duty to protect the incredible machine that we built together! Oh, this guy. So, the thrust of your testimony, Professor, is that based upon his hypothesis, metal objects cannot be moved by this method of instantaneous kinesis. In other words... In other words, since the screwdriver is made of metal, even if it remained lodged in the victim's chest, its subsequent discovery on the stage, despite the victim being found elsewhere, is not an inconsistency. Therefore, Therefore, Professor Albert Hairbrain could still have been the killer. My great hypothesis holds, you see. He doesn't even care. He just made a case against himself, and he seemingly does not care. Do you understand what you did? We had to make the cage used to contain the subjects from wood from that ver for that very reason. I was not addressing you, witness. Um, Professor Hairbrain. Yes? Whose side are you on? I don't take sides, Mr. Naruto. No, no, no. My only interest lies in upholding my hypothesis. I'm a scientist after all. Oh my god. Bro, you're going to get accused for murder. And you'll never be able to do science ever again. Do you understand this? Clearly, you do not. Is he working for us or against us? It's very hard to tell. Let's see how you cross-examine how you cross-examine this testimony, my Nipponese friend. Yes, fire away, Mr. Naruto. Oh my God! Everything in life is against me. Everything. To be clear, I'm still at the stage of gathering data in my research. 
about that. Hold it! And yet, your retort to my argument was lacking in confidence in any way. No scientist can find the truth without finding, first finding self-belief. Those were the words of a certain scientist I hold in the very highest esteem. But you realize that dispros disproving my argument puts you in a very precarious position, don't you? No scientist should strive to protect himself more than he strives to protect the truth. More words of the same grade scientist, you know? Words that are causing me a lot of trouble. Who is this scientist? I'm afraid I couldn't tell you, Mr. Naruto. But, but as soon as I remember the magnificent genius's name, you'll be the first to know. It might be worth keeping the names of your idols to mind. You're wasting your breath, my learned friend. This scattered brain even forgets my name at times. So Lord Van Zeeks really did have a friend once, but I didn't notice hell freezing over. <laughs> stayed put okay hold it uh, your hypothesis states it so this isn't proven then no no of course not it's merely a hypothesis but a good one based on upon thousands of calculations but it is widely known that metals can be decomposed by electrolysis yes of course so i am right my hypothesis is clearly correct what is it about incriminating himself that makes this man so happy? It's the whole reason that the birdcage is made of wood, you see? Sorry, the birdcage? Yes, that's what I call the Sea of Tusa cage in which Mr. Asmund was pleased for the kinesis. Ah, the jail cell in which the victim was detained. It did, does seem to be made of timber of some sort. I'll, re I'll thank you to not. Uh, I'll thank you not to refer to it as an instrument of incarceration, your lordship. In short, any weapon lodged in the victim wouldn't, when he was beamed away by instantaneous kinesis, would have been left behind on the stage if it were made of metal. Correct? Yes, that's it. Yes, yes. And it all fits perfectly with the mathematical model. But the ultimate conclusion, then is that the defendant alone had the opportunity to inflict this fatal injury on the victim, is it not? Ah! Ah, uh, indeed, sir. Someone beat me out of this nightmare. Great. In other words, the point just raised by Mr. Naruto isn't an inconsistency at all. Great. Hold it. Thanks. You seem to be pleased by that. Ah, yes, another example of my hypothesis holding true. But I sense some sarcasm, Mr. Naruto. Are you not pleased? No. I knew it. At the end of the day, I'm the one responsible for Mr. Asmund losing his life. The advancement of science is no excuse. I know that. No, you're quite right. Tell the court, did you have a close relationship with Mr. Asman? Oh, well, no, not really. I mean, I'd only met him two or three times. And we only ever discussed my hypothesis and the project and the research grant, of course. Mr. Asman was a patron of my research. Without him, my work wouldn't have been possible. Hold it! How did you come to know Mr. Asman in the first place? 
a year ago now, a small read provincial science journal published a little paper about my work. That is so tiny. So cute. That's a scientific journal? Good gracious, I should need new spectacles. I might have had an extraordinary hypothesis and great promise, but at the time I had no money. I had to eat tiny little meals at a tiny little cafe and drink watered down water out of a tiny little glass. Mr. Asman read the paper and came to visit me at my tiny little laboratory. And offered you, uh, offered you money to help fund your work. Exactly! That's exactly what happened! I handled the theor uh, theoretical side of things and Mr. Asman provided me with an engineer for the practical. And the three of us produced the fa that fantastic machine together. The machine that you brought to the great exhibition to demonstrate. We, we had to apply the to the government for some sort of inspection to be allowed to exhibit, I think. I didn't understand all the side of things. Mr. Asman took care of it all. It was a wonderful man, really. I owe him everything. Now I have a duty to protect the incredible machine that we built together. Hold it! Hmm. I have a couple things to say. When you say that you built the machine together, does that mean that you were involved in its construction? Oh, yes. Oh, well, not exactly. I'm not good with practical side of machines myself, so the physical construction was done by an engineer. Little remains of your creation now, though, following the explosion. Repair will no doubt be impossible. Yes, yes, I realize that, but still. If, if someone were to gather all the broken parts, that they could discover the secret of my hypothesis. But Mr. Asmund and I toiled over that machine for so long, we put our hearts and souls into it. I have to protect our work. So what's left in the machine must be kept safe. That's only fair because what happened was an accident. That's the extent of the testimony then. Uh, thank goodness for that. I don't want him doing any more damage. He's already practically proven that he could have been the culprit. It seems as though all he really cares about is defending his hypothesis. Still, I wonder. What if his hypothesis is just fundamentally flawed? My hypothesis states that Kinesis cannot transport metal, hence the metal weapon would have stayed put. Okay, so it has to be this second point here. There's, there's really no other option that could be correct. So, we're trying to prove his hypothesis is flawed. He says that the Kinesis can o cannot transport metal. Hence the metal weapon would have stayed put. But what if the victim had metal on him? Can we prove against that? Um. Bro. Okay, so you can clearly see that this is wooden. But his glasses, for one, wouldn't that be metal? And this button even could be metal. I can't tell. Button could be plastic. But, hmm. I don't really have anything else to say against it besides that. So we're just gonna go with the picture, and uh, because there's very little other options that we have. Objection! Ah, nice. Professor Hairbrain, you say that according to your hypothesis, nothing made of metal can be beamed by instantaneous kinesis using the machine you made, is that right? Yes, that's right. Spot on, exactly correct. In that case, I'd ask you to have a look at this photograph that was taken at the scene. In particular, I'd like you to pay attention to the victim's face. Okay. You can clearly see that Mr. Asman is wearing a pair of spectacles with a metal rim. What? Metal? No! Metal can't! That's not... Metal! No! We've already established that the proposed murder weapon, the screwdriver, was found on the stage. However, if your hypothesis correctly predicted that outcome, 
it should also have predicted that the metal rimmed spectacles would have been found in the same place. My hypothesis! Professor Harebrain, this isn't easy for me to say, but your hypothesis is clearly flawed. Oh yeah, we're a scientist now, bitch. Let's go. Council, what is the what is this the implication of this? If on the day in question, the alleged instantaneous kinesis never actually took place, then it's entirely possible that the victim was killed somewhere other than on the stage. And in that case, someone other than the defendant could have been the culprit. My hypothesis is sound! Proved it on the day! I proved it that day! The experiment was a success! The experiment was proof of all my work! He's freaking the fuck out. <sighs> if I could say something here, in my capacity as a fellow of the Royal Society. Yes, journal number four, go ahead. As a man of science, there is one thing I simply cannot abide. It's that that's a fraud who pretends to be a fellow man of science. What? Wait, great Scott, are you suggesting my science is suspect? It's just been disproved, hasn't it? In front of all of us. In other words, the whole demonstration was a complete nonsense from start to finish. Believe me, my fellow jurors, when I tell you that this man is a heel, a bounder, and a fraud. I say the wreckage of that machine should be stripped down and thoroughly examined. No, never! That machine is the essence of my entire hypothesis! It's protected by the Special Dispensation for the Scientific Equipment Act! What the devil are the Blasted Act all about? Who made up such a daft role? I don't like the way this seems to be going. What's the best way for me to help the professor? Oh, I guess I have to raise an objection. 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 Professor Harebrain has yet to perfect his invention. That would seem to be the case, yes? But even so, even so what? Going to such trouble and expense to create a fake machine to display in public. He would have absolutely no reason to do such a thing. He had an obvious reason to do exactly that. For the research grant money. If the government was foolish enough to have deemed the man's ridiculous notion plausible, he and his conspirators would have received a handsome sum indeed. C conspirators uh, What would the value of such a grant? Ten pounds? You're an order of magnitude out, madam. Five hundred pounds a year. Uh, you could live handsome on that much for years. The society's noticed an increase in bogus public demonstrations in the field of science recently. Plenty of scientists arguing with each other to get the largest slice of the funding cake. People's greed is plenty motive enough for murder, I assure you. No, 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 I haven't deceived anyone, least of all the government. My hypothesis is sound, the science is sound. Please, you must believe me. Objection! No matter how unbelievable this hypothesis may seem to you, ladies and gentlemen, the fact remains that the victim was transported instantly to the Crystal Tower. Which means that the experiment was a success. Ah, Beric! And therefore, the only person who could have possibly have committed this murder is the accused. Oh, Beric. <laughs> Where is this heading? I have no idea. <laughs> My lord, if I may. Yes, Lord Van Zeeks. The prosecution would like to summon new witnesses to the stand. New witnesses? What would be the nature of their involvement? They were spectators of the demonstration at the exhibition, who were occupying special seats. Eyewitnesses? 
Very well, the court grants the prosecution's request. I should very much like to hear from eyewitnesses to the incident. The prosecution stance is clear. The experiment was no pis postish. Postish? Postish? Sham. Oh, okay. The experiment was no sham. Got it. Had to really dig for that one. The accused had killed the financier victim, though, there on the public stage before the very eyes of the spectators. Now, my learned friend. Uh, yes? It's time for you to make your own stance clear. There's clearly a flaw in the professor's hypothesis. I can definitely see that. But where does that leave me? We shall take a short recess now. During which time the prosecution will prepare its new witnesses to take the stand. Okay, let's hope that in this recess, Sholmes helps and miraculously comes back. Please. Please? Please. In that case, court is adjourned for 20 minutes. Okay. Wish us the best of luck. To be continued. Oh boy. Trial part two. I guess it's still part one, just research. Ten forty four AM. Oh boy. Mr. Naruto. What on earth were you playing at just now? Oh brother. What on earth were you playing at all along? My hypothesis! My amazing hypothesis! You've been picking holes in it from the start! Sorry about that. But you promised me! You said you'd prove that dreaded explosion was an accident, not murder! You said you'd keep my pre pre your, my precious invention from falling into anyone else's hands! But all you've done so far is try to undermine me! That's part of my job. I did make you a promise, you're right. I said that I'd believe in you and fight for your freedom to the very end, but I also told you I was no scientist. I don't understand your hypothesis. The fact is, there's an undeniable flaw in your logic, isn't there? But if I just return through some equations, but if I just run through some equations, yes, you see, it's because my work is incomplete. Perhaps it is, nevertheless, a man died as a consequence, didn't he? Oh. Oh, no! Yeah, somebody died, by the way. You're right. You're so right. It's all my fault. And I have no right to blame you for my failures. I'm a disaster, not just as a scientist, but as a human being. Well, that might be a little over the top. And while we're on the subject... What about Beric? He's being awful. Claiming his old university friend to be a murderer, you mean? He's a disaster, not just as a prosecutor, but as a human being! We still love him, though, for some reason. Eh, because he's hot. But wait, no! Oh, what? He's the Reaper, isn't he? Perhaps he's not classified as Homo sapiens anymore. Oh my god. Yes. Uh, he's not... Uh, okay. Glad that's cleared up. So yes, he's a vampire. Can I double check something with you? What? The machine and demonstration you prepared, they were based entirely on your hypothesis, I presume? There was no trickery involved? 
I drew the plans for the machine with my very own hands. Every line was painstakingly drawn with the firm belief that science is the only future. So yes, it's true that my hypothesis hasn't reached maturity yet, but please, Mr. Naruto, you must believe in it. All right. Professor, I understand. No help from Sholmes. Damn. It all hinges on that demonstration. If the professor's hypothesis is sound as he claims, it leaves him as the only person who could possibly have killed the victim. On the other hand, Mr. Sholmes was adamant. A practical implementation such as was attempted by the professor at the Great Exhibition is quite impossible. So really, what should I be trying to prove here? Eleven AM. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby reconvene the proceedings of this court. Counsels for the defense and prosecution, are you ready for the new witnesses to testify? The prosecution is ready, my lord. And as is the defense, my lord. So, Lord Van Zeeks, I believe these next witnesses seem saw the demonstration on the day in question with their own eyes. Indeed they did. And as luck would have it, one of them is a police detective. So the testimony we are about to hear can be considered highly reliable. Perfect, a detective of all people. The prosecution stands remains unchanged. Though it, in, though it ended in tragedy, the demonstration on the day in question was scientifically sound. And consequently, the sole person with the opportunity to have committed this act of murder is the only other individual to have present to have been present on the stage at the time the accused. Thank you, counsel. The prosecution's position is clear. So, bring forth your witnesses now. Bailiff, show the witnesses in. The witnesses whose proximity to the incident on the day in question will clarify the truth unequivocally. Gina, hi. Witnesses, state your names and occupations for the court to hear. My name is Balthazar Lune. I am the impression auto of all the hot air balloons in vicinity of the experimental stage. My name is. Oh god, that's very German. <laughs> I'm not good with German. My name is Wilhelm Gostrich Sigmund Ormstein. I, I have come to the great exhibition all the way from my home of, Bohem of Bohemia. Okay. I'll try. I'll try. I'm gonna butcher these accents. I'm very sorry. What? I am very rich. <laughs> I bought this balloon. I am rich. Yes. <laughs> balloon tells me I'm rich. <laughs> Inspector Gina Lestrade, Scotland Yard. Oh my god, she's the detective. That's so cute. I'm a great detective, even though Locke Sholmes agrees. I was on security du duty at the exhibition and I got to go up in one of their balloons. It was amazing. Gina, again! But she did mention that she'd seen the disaster from up in a balloon, actually, didn't she? And she clearly loved every minute of it. 
There were three balloons flying near the public experimentation stage when the incident occurred. Two of these witnesses were in one such balloon at the time and saw events unfold from the skies above. You make it sound like they were all in clouds. Uh, it was only an altitude of circa 60, 60 feet. Very low. Well, you can't see nothing if you fly too high, can ya? 60 feet, about 18 meters then. Thank you for your introductions now. You will give your formal testimony for the court. Can't you describe exactly what you witnessed, especially of those of you who had a vantage point above the stage? It was an incident, incident, terrible, terrible. I was only grateful that my balloons were not damaged. There's this huge bang from the stage and then the next second, another bang in the sky beside us. In the sky. And from amid, amid the smoke, a cage appeared out of nowhere. The cage had fell from the sky like a stone and crashed into the crystal tower. I didn't get a good look inside the cage, but no one went near it after it crashed into the tower. A most extraordinary collective account, I must say. Could I just clarify something? There's a detail in the witness's testimony that I've not heard any mention of until now. Uh, specifically that there was a two explosions? More precisely, two explosions in two separate places, yes. When the demonstration began, the balloon carrying the witnesses was around here. There were other balloons in the air nearby at the time, carrying other passengers as well, to be clear. Then, as power was supplied to the machine for the demonstration, the first explosion occurred. The so-called birdcage that contained the victim disappeared from the stage and a moment later... The second explosion occurred, directly adjacent to the balloon carrying the witnesses. The birdcage appeared at the site of the explosion, subsequently to plummet down into the crystal tower. I was very surprised as suddenly a cage appeared before my eyes vis a person inside. The blast was so hot and I, but I, wanted, I didn't want to miss a thing, so I kept my eyes wide. Oh, I'm rich. Please give me balloon. Okay. Okay. I still have lots of money! <laughs> Precisely. Who is this curious infant? <laughs> I am told that he is a young noble of bohemian royalty. Apparently, he disguised himself in order to steal unnoticed into the Great Exhibition. Ja, I am here in London on a sightseeing trip with my elementary school. We will have to benefit of a ch have the benefit of a child's point of view in the testimony. Do we really need that? When I remove my mask, this is, this is this is what I look like. Ah, yes, I see a delightful face, I'm sure. Ja, everybody says so. Uh, great disguise, then. The point is, the testimony of these witnesses further substantiates the facts of the court. Namely, that despite ending in an explosion, instantaneous kinesis was successfully demonstrated. And furthermore, that arrived that until the arrival of the police, no one approached the crystal tower where the victim fell. Therefore, only the accused who was with Mr. Asman on the stage could have possibly committed the murder. Ah, uh, yes, thank you, counsel. The prosecution's views on the matter are quite clear. So, the defense is cross-examination now, please. Yes, my lord! Here we go. Yeah. 
It was an incident to terrible. I was only grateful that my balloons were not damaged. There's this huge bang from the stage, and then the next second, another bang in the sky beside us. I want to hear more about that. Oops, I went the wrong way. So you actually saw the accident happen from up in the air? Yup! And it's amazing what a detective gets to do, eh? I'm telling you, Odo, being a, being a lawyer is a mug's game. You should join the force and we can fly we can go flying together. You know me so well. Ah uh, yes, well anyway, could you tell us exactly what you saw, do you think? Everything! We saw everything because we were up above it all. That dodgy cove climbing into that cage and that dodgy professor pulling all them levers. And that's when, I, when it happened. That's when there was a massive bang and the cage disappeared just like that. You are describing the moment the subject's body was decomposed by the electricity, I believe. I don't know what to make of it, but then there was another bang right in the air. I looked around and there was a huge great fireball right next to us in the sky. And then there was nothing there before. Excuse me. Um... Master Gots, does your memory have the day differ? My teacher at elementary school said that when you meet something, someone for the first time, you should always uh, use their f full name. Ah, yes, um, uh, what was it again? William Gottstreich Sigmund's uh, Sigmund or Ormstein. Just the four names then? Okay, the point is, do you have something to say? Something to add in response to Detective Gina Lestrade's last remark, perhaps? Oi, get it right, Odo! It's Inspector Lestrade! Why does everyone have a problem with how I address them at the moment? That is not what I saw. Oh? Yeah, there was a second explosion and it was right before our balloon. That is true. But I'm sure. Which is why I said it, it. One minute there was nothing there and the next a massive explosion. My teacher in elementary school said that when someone else is speaking, if you are rude enough to interrupt, you will have the most awful life imaginable. Are all bohemians brought up to be so full of joy? Oh, he's gonna say, I am rich. I have balloon. Just before- oh, he didn't say I am rich this time. Okay. Uh, just before the second explosion happened next to our balloon, I clearly witnessed... ...a green balloon flying in the sky. Ah, a green balloon. We do have evidence of that. Hey, you what? I never saw nothing like that. Well, I did! I saw it, and you can't say I didn't! I will complain to the council, I will cry and scream! My testimony is the truth, I am Bohemian Prince! You cannot say it's a lie, that is not allowed! Okay... Playing the bleeding royalty card, are you? Typical! Says the orphan who likes to remind people she works for Her Majesty's Police. What's happening? In that case, young man, I must ask you to amend your formal testimony. In the interests of the cordial national relations between Great Britain and Bohemia. It was not the sky that exploded, it was a green balloon that was next to ours at the time. Hold it! A green balloon, you say? Are you sure about that? Of course I'm sure I'm proud Bohemian Prince. All these questions are making me boring. I think you meant, uh, port. <laughs> uh, nobody tell him. English is very annoying. The language of my countrymen is far superior. Regazio, is it, very, it is very wrong to lie. Lie. Flying balloons never explode. For the same reason the planets never explode. It is logical. 
Please tell me that doesn't mean logical. If you insult me, you insult the, all of Bohemia. Madai! I will have the army come and shoot all of your stupid balloons out of the sky! All of them! Here you are, your highness. If only all international incidents were so easily resolved. Now that peaceful relations have been restored here in the courtroom, perhaps we could return to the testimony. Did you also see the moment that the cage materialized, Mr. Lune? Oh no no, I did see the explo ex explosione myself, however. Explosione. Sorry, I'm gonna butcher. Um, these accents very bad. I cannot do Italian very well or Bohemian, but we try and <laughs> The cage it fell from the sky like a stone it crashed into the crystal tower Hold it! Did you see that actually happen? No, in reality, it did not. I saw it after it hit the tower. That was a grand confusion about this around the stage. I ran to see what happened. I was terrorized by the idea that one of my balloons had crashed. I suppose there they are, his livelihood. And when I looked up into the sky, all my precious balloons were still there. I saw it though. I saw it slam into the tower. After all, I am a detective now. Then tell us what you saw, Inspector Lestrade. That's what I like to hear. Okay. I can get a good look inside the cage, but no one went to near it after it crashed into the tower. Oh, Was it you who gave the order to keep people away? You're right, Odo. How could it have been me? I was up in the balloon, weren't I? So, because I weren't available, it was the boss who had to leg it over there. He was getting shoved and kicked all over the panic, all, all over by the panic and spectators as he tried to seal, seal off the scene. It was a real sight to behold, I can tell you. Amazing. Poor Inspector Gregson. So anyway, I couldn't see the cage that was well, that was bleh, that well because of all the smoke. And I didn't really want to see, to be honest. I was scared out of my wits. Keep it together, Inspector. The prosecution really is asserting that the demonstration was genuine, but what if it was actually some kind of switch around trick instead? That would mean that the victim was never actually on the stage in the first place. That the two explosions would have thrown everyone watching into a panic for sure. I think I need to find out more about what exactly people saw at the time. Oh, could it have been a uh, wax model, perhaps? Oh. Just say. What evidence do we have? We have evidence of like the green cloth, which comes from the green balloon explosion. That's pretty much it. And also, in this picture, there's only two air balloons, not three. Okay. Um, what can we prove against? I am only grateful that my balloons were not damaged. Yeah, that's okay. Huge bang from the stage, and then the next second, another bang in the sky beside us. Okay. It was a green ex a green balloon that was next to ours at the time. Cage, it fell from the sky like a stone and crashed into the crystal tower. The cage? Like the whole cage. 
Oh, wait, I'm stupid. Really? Oh, he is still in the cage. Cage above from the sky like a stone and crashed into the crystal tower. Didn't get a good look inside the cage, but no one went near it after it crashed into the tower. It seems really stupid, but my only thought is to present the green balloon piece here. Or green cloth. But I don't know how that actually solves anything. I just don't have any other ideas. But this is technically evidence that supports what he's saying. It's not a proof against it, so this is... I don't know what this actually is solving. <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway. Nobody can stop me. Objection! <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll take it. I'll take it. I took that with flying colors, like a true woman. Perhaps I need to reconsider this. <laughs> the judge can stop me. Oh, but I got four more tries. The judge can't stop me. Um, did we press this? Hold it! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, let's go through these one by one. Let's narrow down. You're grateful that your balloons were not damaged. That might sound really silly, but... I mean, like... No, that's pretty silly. We really don't have anything that we could present besides this piece of cloth. There's this huge bang from behind the stage, and then the next second, another bang in the sky beside us. Can't say anything about that. Not the sky that exploded, it was a green balloon that was next to ours at the time. Cage fell from the sky like a stone and crashed into the crystal tower. a good look inside the cage, but no one went near it after it crashed. Let me read one thing. Okay. Doesn't really say anything about that. Okay. What? What? No. Do you want me to try it? Yeah, I can smell it. It's all yours. <laughs> You're changing your mind. Do you want me to try it or do you not want me to try it? Oh my god. Dom wants me to try his chai tea that he just made. It smells so strong. <laughs> oh my god. That's so strong. <laughs> okay, I can't take that too much. <laughs> it's not bad. Yeah. It's Just like too much cinnamon? I think it needs to dial down on the cinnamon a little bit. 
Because, like, I can handle a little sip, but yeah. when you take a bigger sip, it's very cinnamon. Like, it burns my throat kind of bad. Yeah. Less cinnamon, and I would probably drink it. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> Tom's been making chai tea at home, homemade for a couple times. Ugh. I truly don't know where they're going with this. Oh. You can't do cinnamon. I do like cinnamon, but in just in very small doses, because cin cinnamon gets strong very, very fast. <laughs> like an extra pinch of cinnamon I feel like goes a very very long way Cinnamon was strong. <laughs> this isn't gonna be it. I love. Oh wait, that worked. How Crystal gives Dom cooking tips. Style. It's adorable. <laughs> Thank you for the hundred bits. Ugh. Well, that worked. Okay, Mr. Lune, in your testimony, you said that all three of the balloons you had operating at the time were undamaged. See, uh, that is correct. I can't do Italian. I can't. Maybe I should just. It's just embarrassing. <laughs> If they had been caught up in the espl 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 It would have been terrible! If I just do this, it helps the Italian! <laughs> you would do that. Do you actually do that a lot? I heard it was just a meme that it doesn't actually happen in Italian culture. You actually do that? That's not a meme? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna be doing this. All right, I'm, I'm gonna do this then. It's gonna help me. Just so you know. <laughs> but I'm sorry I'm butchering your accent a lot. <clears throat> sorry Italians out there. I wonder if you might know what this is. I think it may be. <laughs> Part of the balloon. I can't do this. I can't do this. It's so bad. It's all over the top. A burnt piece of fabric of the envelope. <laughs> Sorry, the envelope. <laughs> oh, pardon. This is the large round part of the balloon, which becomes filled with hot air. <laughs> It is made from a very thick, thick fabric lined with the rubber, and you do not want it to rip when you are in the sky. <laughs> Just as I thought. This piece, of, this piece of cloth was found near the experimentation stage. In other words, as Mr. Kotz testified, a green balloon did indeed explode that day. I'm so sorry. Eh? If all the balloons in the sky above the experimentation stage belong to you, Mr. Lune, then your statement that they were all undamaged clearly contradicts the d of evidence. Look at a little sus there. I think this is a whole stage operation to, um... Having just spent 10 whole pounds for the experience, seems to me like those things crash 50% of the time anyway. Oh, Von Zeeks is mad. You know what I think happened? Here's the crystal theory. So this, uh, this heavy crime syndicate or whatever they're talking about in the back streets of London, uh, that Mr. Asmund was uh, the, uh, leader of, uh, they set up this operation 
and with Mr. Lune, Mr. the Balloon Man, to go, the balloon goes up uh, the Crystal Tower at the same time. They blow a bomb that's attached to the beam device to make it tilt up to seem like it was a dud. They knew the experiment was never gonna be a success, but they made it to look like it. So they put a mimic of the cage, the people that built it, to get a second one with the real Asmund in there, and it drops from the hot air balloon, the explosion. So it looks like it was done by that. And what was in the, uh, and the, on the experimentation stage? Well, they replaced it with a wax model. It's obvious. It's so obvious. It's just a wax model, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the crystal theory. Thank you. It is 100,000 IQ. I know. The instantaneous kinesis did occur, but after the explosion on the stage, the point of materialization shifted to a location occupied by a balloon, causing the balloon to explode. Yes, imminently plausible. An unfortunate traffic accident, as it were, but it changes nothing about the pertinent facts. This I cannot accept! Why not, Mr. Lune? You were suggesting that I am a liar! That person's died in the balloon incident! There is no need to get fired up, Mr. Lune. The victim was the sole fatality that day. Uh, that's right, and I prove it! Balthazar and Lune is not a liar! They were no such balloon in the sky, it is non plausible! <laughs> You're saying it's impossible, why? This court has more important matters to discuss than the number of balloons that were operating that day. I! Objection! But we can't ignore the fact that nobody appears to have known anything about this other balloon until now. My lord, the defense calls for further testimony from Mr. Lune. This is clearly more to the truth than than uh, more to the truth here than meets the eye. It's imperative that we clear up the issue of this phantom balloon, I believe. Witness, you will give supplementary testimony about the balloons you were operating at the exhibit. A oh, crazy, my lord. <laughs> I'm. So, I hate myself. Oh my god. Oh, this is bad. It's fine. I'm gonna keep doing it. As I said, the Balthazar Luna is a no liar. Every balloon I had in the sky landed safely. All three of my balloons were carrying passengers, and they fell to the ground in an explosion. What a catastrophe! But you can't get away from the fact that a burnt up, but a burnt up cloth was found at the scene, can ya? The cop was at the yard, reckoned it probably, uh, it'll, it was probably some debris thrown from the explosion on the stage. This stupid old ragazzo is mistaken. My balloons have the red and blue zigzag stripes anyway. Oh. <clears throat> So your assertion is that the balloon this child saw was not one belonging to you? See, si, exactamente! If he even saw a balloon in the first place! I do not like the sound of it! It is very bad for business! I have a good mind to sue the land of Bohemia! If you attack us, we will fight back! It will be war at the war! What is happening? You just shit on each other and... What happened to All Out War? Mr. Lunate doesn't appear to be lying. But that doesn't change the fact that the testimony and evidence are contradictory here. If the defense is unable to find fault with the witness's te statements, the court will consider them the truth. Think long and hard on that, my learned friend. The situation has clearly changed now. I have to get to the bottom of what happened here, no matter what it takes. 
All right, cross-examination time. Let's go. As I said, the Balthazar Luni is no lighter. Every balloon in the sky is lit in the sky and landed safely. Uh. Okay. Hold it. You couldn't just have forgotten one, maybe? It's ignore. I might not know this if I was given 100 lentils and one was missing. And, but we are talking about three enormous balloons. Do you believe I could make a mistake about something so grand and expensive? I took the liberty of having Inspector Gregson check this gentleman's warehouse. I have the uh, report here. It clearly says a total of three balloons. It would appear no mistake has been made then. Surely Miss Lestrade could have been sent for such a menial task. What, me? I'll tell you what I told the boss. East End kids like me can only count up to two. Obviously, that ain't true, but the boss bought it and said he'd have, a go to have to go himself in, in that case. Ah. Uh... What a catastrophe! Hold it! It would be a, quite a catastrophe if they fell to the ground for any reason, I think. On that note, Mr. Lunate, tell me, what is it that keeps these balloons in the sky? Are you an idiot? Uh, sorry? That is like asking, oh, why does a candle burn bright? It burns bright because it burns bright, and the balloon flies because it flies. What else? That must be Italian for... I don't know. <laughs> there are two types of flying balloons. Hot air balloons and gas balloons. Hot air balloons work on the principle of hot air being less dense than cold air. Whereas gas balloons derive their lift by using a gas that is lighter than air. See, and my balloons are filled with a magic gas, I believe. Hydrogen. Lighter than air, but highly explosive. Good lord! I do not permit the smoking of the cigarettes in any of my balloons. The magic gas does not like a fire. Even a small, s even the, s <laughs> even a small spark of static electricity could cause the entire balloon to explode. Oh, what is the matter with you, Ignore? All that comes out of your mouth is explosion, 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 explosion. I tell you, my balloons are perfectly safe. They have to be, or I cannot eat. None of my balloons exploded that day. I am complete, completely sure. But if you still say that is what happened, I must show you. You must show me the proof. All right, so Mr. Looney had three balloons in the air that day. If none of them were damaged, then what was the one that exploded? But you can't get away from the fact that a burned up, <laughs> burned up bit of cloth was found at the scene, can you? Hold it! Got it. I was surprised to find the piece of fabric still at the scene, actually. Didn't you search the area surrounding the search the stage for clues? Nah, I'm not into picking stuff off the ground, me. Always works out way better. Diving into people's pockets instead. She's so proud, I love her. So much for the new career path. Mind you, the boss was at his was on his hands and knees and picking up all kinds of rubbish off the from the floor. Thing is, thing is though, the cage went crashing into the crystal tower, didn't it? So what's what? That's where that's where most of the investigating was going on. Even so, I would have thought someone from Scotland Yard would have gathered it up as evidence. Cool, listen to you. You stumble across a bit of balloon and you suddenly you suddenly you're the best investigator in the world. Pardon? Well, you ain't got a badge, have you? Like this one? I could arrest you with this if I wanted to. I wouldn't put it past her. Come to think of it, there was talk of some scorching on the ground at, at a meeting, at a meeting we had about the investigation. The coppers at the yard reckoned it was probably some debris thrown from the explosion on the stage. Hold it. There were, there was considerable damage to the stage and surrounding area, wasn't there? 
Yeah, some of the coves were what, what were watching the experiment were caught in the blast and injured. Good job the old contraption didn't keel over, eh? I hadn't even considered that. It seems that there was a great panic after the incident occurred. Nevertheless, the police shouldn't have missed a torn piece of the envelope from a, from a balloon. Inspector Gregson can expect repercussions. Like me swiping all his fish and chips, eh? The man's sole pleasure. And none of this matters! That scrap of balloon envelope means nothing! Niente! This stupid old rug house was a mistake! And my balloons have the b red and blue zigzag stripes anyway! As I thought, Mr. Luna's testimony just doesn't quite add up. The young bohemian boy claims to have seen another fourth balloon, but Mr. Luna vehemently denies the possibility, and it's hard to imagine the man in charge could be mistaken about the number that there that were in the air. Still, this inconsistency must tell us something, I'm sure. You mean, the color is wrong? I see you, senor! I do not have any green balloons in my warehouse! And yet, a piece of green cloth was found at the scene? And it's unmistakably from a balloon. And well, uh, well, I do not know how that could be! For the sake of argument, let's say that a green balloon did explode above the stage. You couldn't therefore conclude that it happened on the day in question. Why not? There have been recreational balloons, balloon flights over Hyde Park operating from before the Great Exhibition. One could have exploded on some earlier date, unfortunate, as I'm sure you would agree. You, you, you believe it may have been from some earlier balloon accident that predates the exhibition. See, si, exactamente, as the senor says, it is not from one of my balloons. What? What? Clearly, this, this little regazio, regazio from Bohemia is mistaken about what he saw. Baby mad. Excuse me. Rich baby mad. Is something wrong, Master Gotts? It's Master Wilhelm Gottsrich Sigismund Ormstein. Ormstein. It was on the tip of my tongue. Ja, something is very wrong. I know what I saw. There was a green, green balloon there. I swear it. I swear all over Bohemia. You can speak as much bad language as you like, but it doesn't change nothing. Oh. You're fighting. If you do not have evidence, Regazzo, then I must tell your parents to punish you, eh? Perhaps we'll let the judge decide when it comes to punishments. Evidence? What is this evidence? Uh, to give a simple example, young man. A, pho a photograph, for instance. Some tangible proof of what you claim. Uh, well, why didn't you say so sooner? I have the photograph here. Good gracious! What? I had not been in a balloon for a little while, so I was very excited. I took lots and lots of photographs. Of the Crystal Tower, of the Bohemian Exhibit, in the streets of London, on the Hot Eel Cellar, the balloon. And the instantaneous kinesis experiment? Did you take a picture of that? Ja, one picture. Really, you did take one. But all I wanted was a ride in a balloon! I was not interested in boring experiments! Never mind that, can you show us the photograph? Of course! Oh, then you will see! You will see that I am not lying! That I really did see a green balloon! Well, I see you're all too shocked to speak. 
Uh, yes, I think shocked is indeed the word, uh, young man. But it's black and white. I mean, it still stands that you would see the zigzag pattern on the balloon if it was the red and blue ones. So the green balloon didn't have any patterns, so you can still say it works. But! But that is not my fault! That is the fault of this stupid person who made the camera! Ah! Oh, that is one very bohemian sounding cry. Ah! Uh, very well, the court will accept this photograph as evidence. The photograph of the balloon has been entered into the court record. It's not my fault! It's the fault of the person who made the camera! Well, never mind. I'm sure you have plenty of wonderful sepia memories to take home with you. In any case, when exactly did you take the photograph? Well, it was on the day of the big explosion. You don't say. When I pressed the shutter release, there was this very loud bang. And a hot wind shell rushed over my face. That means this photograph was taken a split second before the explosion occurred. Oh, well, if you ask me, uh, this black and white photograph uh, changes nothing. I cannot give uh, the flying fig. Lovely language you've picked up. <laughs> As I thought, Mr. Looney says, but he doesn't quite add up. Okay, we already heard those. Blah, 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 blah. Shit, the photograph doesn't show the... the top. Oh! It's interesting. Okay, so this uh, this does show the moment where the beam this is where the beam was prior to explosion. So it was facing the correct angle prior. Um the the picture isn't taken high enough. I feel like we could have seen the the zigzag here, but um mm. and I still like my waxwork model theory. Who stands like this? Just saying. I was hoping at the base you could see something. And then there's that, but you can't exactly see that, but look at this kid back here. Oh lord, he running! Nice. Well, that answers a few things. Let's see where we can present this. Um... All three of my balloons were carrying passengers if they fell to the ground in an explosion. What a catastrophe. Oh, I didn't even notice. Yeah, there is no passengers in this green balloon, is there? You can clearly see the basket empty. I mean, it's a deep basket, but yeah, it is also weird that there's no one in it. Okay. Uh, you can't get away from the fact that a burn-up bit of cloth was found at the scene. The coppers at the yard reckoned it was probably some debris thrown from the explosion on the stage. Stupid Regazzo is mistaken. My balloons have uh, stripes. Okay, okay. Where do I present this? Fuck. But it didn't land safely. Hmm. Hmm. 
Sorry. Oh my god. My brain just went on a whole tangent. Really? Wow. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. All three of my balloons are carrying passengers. If they fell to the ground, it's supposed to be only what a catastrophe. So one of these two, uh... Yeah, okay, so this... Uh, there's, there's no passengers in this balloon, but this is a fourth balloon. I don't think this is gonna be the answer, but I will present it here. We'll just see what happens. Objection! Oh wow, it worked. Okay. Unfortunately, the photograph Mr. Master Gotts took can't tell us the color of the balloon, but it can tell us something else, something crucially important. What? It shows that the pictured balloon wasn't carrying any passengers. My goodness, you're right! But surely all the balloons would have been carrying passengers. There would be no sense in it otherwise. So see, they are for pleasure, for seeing the view. My balloons only fly with passengers. Which tells us that the pictured balloon isn't one of them. So when the incident occurred that day, there was a fourth balloon in the skies above the experimentation stage. The mysterious green balloon. I know nothing, niente! I can only tell you one thing. If this balloon was not carrying passengers, then it was not one of mine. Objection! Uh-oh. Von Zeeks isn't destroying a lot of wine glasses lately. He, he was very quick at the beginning, but ever since then... There are illegal tradesmen everywhere you care to look. Clearly, one such entrepreneur decided to capitalize on the opportunity presented by the Great Exhibition and managed to operate balloon fights on Mr. Lune's patch without him realizing. See, si, see, si, the competition! Trying to steal my profits! I did not know this because of the experimental that was wrong on the stage! This fourth balloon exploded at the very same moment Mr. Asman was beamed from the stage below. Right. So them scraps them fell to the ground after and 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 left them scorch marks. They didn't come from the stage at all. It was bits of balloon that come the rain and down. But because no one was in it, it didn't get no attention. A mysterious fourth balloon carrying no passengers, silently floating over the experimentation Objection. stage. Hmm. This photograph shows us nothing more. A stray balloon carrying no one and operated by some rogue trader. Clearly, it has nothing to do with the case. Its relevance does elude me, I must say. The court has been has seen sufficient evidence and heard ample testimony already. The prosecution calls for this trial to be concluded. Really? Have we really got to the truth? No, I can't let this opportunity slip away. The jurors' minds are made up and not in our favor. What else can this photograph tell us? Is there nothing more that we can learn from it? Sir, there is more! Objection! Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, wait. Please don't give your decisions yet. The photograph from Mr. Master Gotts may well be hiding one more vital clue. A vital clue! Objection! We're well past the point of mere possibilities. It's time for definitives now, so tell the court. What exactly does this alleged clue in the photograph prove? The cause. We can reasonably assume that the pictured balloon was destroyed in the searing heat of the explosion. Ja, that's right, ja! Evidently, because the birdcage from the, the kinesis machine materialized in the sky where it had been flying. And then the balloon, being filled with flammable hydrogen, instantly and explosively ignited Objection. it. 
No, that's not what happened. It would appear that this photograph requires closer examination. Counsel for the defense, you will highlight the location of this alleged clue. Oh, God. If you look closely, it's plain enough to see, and what's shown is linked to another piece of evidence that we have. In a way, that leads to an unbelievable conclusion. The clue that heavily suggests the real reason that the balloon exploded. Take that! The timing of this photograph can only be described as miraculous. If you look, you'll notice that there's a bright white line that appears to be pointing directly at the balloon. Most likely a ray of light caught incidentally on the film. I'm afraid I can see nothing of the sort. If you look with a magnifying glass, my lord, it becomes clear what the nature of this bright line really is. Goodness, what is that? Undeniably some flash of light, yes. Oh, golly, do, do you think it might be lightning? Lightning. Okay. It couldn't have been a finer day. I believe we may be looking at fire. A am a lightning fire headed straight for the balloon. Indeed, even to my aging eyes, it would appear to be a flame of some sort. My word, are you suggesting this flame struck the hydrogen gas that filled the balloon? Objection! That's absurd. The balloon would have been 60 feet above the ground at the time. No flame could possibly have reached such a height. Objection! Actually, it's my opinion that a particular piece of evidence found at the scene reveals how this is exactly... how this is, uh, is exactly what did happen. What evidence? If such evidence exists, counsel, thank goodness, and then for goodness sake, present it, man. What evidence explains this mysterious streak of flame that appears to be headed directly for the balloon? Good question. All I got is this green piece of cloth, bro! That's all! Take that! The true nature of the curious slim streak of light is revealed by this! It's not a, a curious answer with a slim chance of being the correct one, I feel. <laughs> it looks somewhat like a piece of firework, but whereas fireworks dazzle their audience. <laughs> You fizzle out in a remarkably disappointing way. Oh, the crossbow! Oh my god. Take that! I'm stupid. This was found hidden at the foot of a small ornamental tree near the scene. Good lord, is that a crossbow? An arrow dipped in oil and set alight could have been shot from this weapon. Sending a flaming arrow straight into the hydrogen-filled balloon. Are you suggesting that crossbow was used deliberately? Blimey, you're right! That streak of light in the photo looks just like an arrow, done it! And then the explosion of the balloon, it was... Uh... Very likely the result of a flaming arrow from this crossbow igniting the hydrogen gas inside it. Oh, we got Van Zeeks right through the heart. Council, this is an extraordinary supposition. Sub if the aim was to cause the balloon to explode, the shooter could have used a gun, of course. However, there's an obvious reason why that would have been out of the question. The noise of the discharge, of course. 
That's right, guns are loud, but using a crossbow, the projectile could be fired at the balloon silently. Well, yeah, if someone had shot a gun off at the exhibition grounds, it would have caused a real panic. But there was a big explosion, there was a big panic anyway, no? I don't like this. I should be pleased to have found a plausible new explanation for all this, but something feels wrong. Objection! Do you understand the implications of what you're saying, my Nipponese friend? If a flaming arrow did indeed hit the balloon, then obviously it would have exploded. And if the birdcage appeared from the cloud of smoke that ensued. Well, wait a minute. What are you really saying here? I don't get it. Was the birdcage beamed up into the sky after all? Or what? My goodness me. Now I understand. That's what that sinking feeling is about. I think there's a good chance that the birdcage was actually concealed inside the balloon all along. Did I just hear that correctly, Council? There's no going back now. The horse has bolted. Let's assume, as you said, that the birdcage was hidden inside the green balloon from the start. On stage, when the experiment was started, the birdcage in the instantaneous kinesis machine disappeared in a cloud of smoke. At that moment, the flaming arrow was fired from the ground, causing the green balloon to explode and drawing the attention of the spectators to the sky above their heads. From amid the smoke, the hidden birdcage then appeared to fall down and crash into the crystal tower. I think you'll all agree it's entirely possible that what I just described is the real truth behind the miraculous experiment carried out that day. Good grief! Van Zeeks is Objection. still... Oh, I thought we would at least get a leg there. No leg? Okay, bro. Ugh, this is ludicrous. What do you've described as no science experiment? It's child's play, a contemptible display of stage magic. Both Mr. Sholmes and Iris said that the experiment was a scientific impossibility. In which case, this is the only way to explain what happened that day. In any case, the victim's body was found inside the birdcage at the Crystal Tower. If the instantaneous kinesis doesn't- didn't take place, how do you explain that? If I may put in a word, as a man of magic myself, such apparent discrepancies can only be easily be explained by some simple deception. Juror number three! All that why- all that would be needed is a doppelganger, someone who looked very similar to the victim, Mr. Asmin. And having this other man appear on the stage to front the show as a body double. Yes, of course. So, in fact, Mr. Asmund must have been inside the birdcage that was concealed inside the balloon right from the start. Objection! That balloon would have been filled with hydrogen. Anything inside it would have been scattered to the four winds when it exploded. No one would ever have embarked on such a risky venture. Not necessarily. The explosive force of the balloon gas would be- would very much depend upon the mixture ratio. Juror number four! Flying balloons are rarely filled with hot, pure hydrogen, but a mixture of other gases such as helium as well. Helium, on its own, doesn't explode. But by controlling the gas mixture ratio, the explosive force can be altered. The mixture ratio. Obviously, the victim's body would have suffered some burns. That would be unavoidable. But not to such an extent as to render this whole obscene charade impossible. So, everything that happened can be explained logically and scientifically. The explosion that engulfed the stage at the start of the experiment was no accident. It was all part of an elaborate deception to make it appear that instantaneous kinesis had occurred. Goodness me. 
if we accept that this is what happened. It means that the victim, Mr. Asman, was never present on the public experimentation stage to begin with. In short, he couldn't have been killed by the defendant who was on stage in full view the entire time. Got him, Van Zeeks. What do you have to say to that? I'm still pointing. This will be very hard for the prosecution to counter. Lord Van Zeeks can't credibly maintain that Professor Harebrain is a suspect now. Who said that? Oh, the professor? He's back. He's mad, bro. Mr. Narodo, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Professor. But you can stop now. Just keep your mouth shut, please. Sorry? What's all this about, Mr. Hairbrain? I, Albert Hairbrain, hereby confess that it, that it was, that it was me who stabbed Mr. Odias. Yes, it was me with my faithful friend and partner, Andrew the Screwdriver! Bro? What? What are you doing?! Defendant, explain this sudden confession! Objection! Professor Hairbrain, what are you talking about? It's it's what I've said all along. I must protect my hypothesis and my precious machine. You stand there and claim it was all a trick, all an elaborate prank, but where's your proof? No, you, you'd have to examine the machine if you wanted to prove it, but then it would be all over. My beautiful hypothesis, hypothesis would be laid bare. I mean, the dignity of it. It's clear that you drew the plans for the experiment, but you didn't actually build it. It's quite conceivable that you were duped, Professor, if you'll just let me... Barrick. Yes. I'll cooperate. I'll do whatever you say. I swear it. I said so, please. Ensure the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act is adhered to and protect my creation! Oh, we got a wine... another wine bottle and glass for this. Good. Pray forgive the discourtesy of filling my hollow chalice at this critical juncture. <laughs> Here's to my learned Nipponese friend. What? And his upcoming attempt to clarify the defense's position in the light of the accused's confession. Do you intend to formally assert that you're- that the experiment was nothing more than a conjuring trick? Because the moment that you do, the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act that protects the professor's invention will cease to apply. The prosecution will then demand a rigorous examination of the machinery involved in order to establish the truth. However, if you acknowledge that the machine is genuine and instrumental in the victim's murder, Number two. Any chance of investigating will be crushed, and the confidentiality of the professor's hypothesis preserved. Well, counsel, what is the defense's op official position on this matter? What Professor Harebrain, my client, actually asked of me was to prove that the explosion on stage was an accident and protect the secrecy of his hypothesis. But there's no way to do that without implying the professor's guilt. Do I protect my client's life 
by asserting his innocence? Or do I uphold my client's re request, but see him condemned? Either way, I can't avoid betraying his trust. You've been silent long enough, is in talking your trade, my learned friend? Or has all knowledge of English escaped your confused Nipponese mind? Mr. Naruto! There's no escape here. I have to make a choice. But it's an impossible one. I have to give up on something, but what? The defense asserts that the defendant instantaneous machine was in fact... I am here for the truth. Uh, the truth, I, I can't say lies. I'm sorry, professor. I am not a liar. This is not what Kazuma would have wanted. <laughs> Kazuma would do the truth. I know that. We reach out to the truth. It is a conjuring trick. And one that I need wine for because I'm nervous. I'll be back. Forgive me, chat, for filling up my hallowed chalice in the courtroom today. A toast to this being a conjuring trick. Fuck the professor and fuck proper scientific invention. We are here for the truth. Cheers. No, I can't say it. My client placed his faith in me. I can't just let him down. What? No. Wait, there was no choice? What must I give up on is not the question you have to ask yourself here. It's what can I protect? What? Honey, what? Sasato san. Okay. Right! Okay, she's here. What the fuck?! Bro! Did 
there will be time to talk later, Mr. Naruhito. For now, we must concentrate on the task at hand. Which is working out not what I have to give up on, but what can I could what I can protect. Professor Hairbrain. Oh uh, yes. Yesterday you told me that science is the pursuit of truth. Well, my job is to pursue the truth, too. Yes, of course. And personally, I believe that you didn't stab Mr. Asman. I think you've come to realize something yourself, too, haven't you? That your experiment and the machine that you built with the victim are questionable. The truth behind that is what we must both pursue now. No! So you finally opened up your eyes. The wine bottle, that's my, oh my God. Two wine bottles, two glasses. Oh God. What? And that's for you. Albert, you can't ignore this any longer. Having heard my learned friend's assertion, don't you have something to say? Barrick! Lord Van Zeeks. Gosh, I've never heard him speak that way before. In truth, there is one thing, something I've remembered that's of relevance. What? On the day it happened, just before I began the experiment, I saw a man near the stage. A man holding that crossbow. I beg your pardon. Professor, did the man have any distinguishing features? What did he look like? Uh, tall. Uh, taller than me, and, and thin, thinner than me, with straight hair, straighter, and whiter than mine. Let me see, uh, one less lens than me too, a monocle. A rather stylish black monocle. But one thing in particular will help to positively identify the man, you see? Uh, I know him very well. After all, he's the engineer who built my invention. What? He built the machine. That's right, Mr. Asman introduced me to him a year ago. He's a man by the name of... Enoch Drebber. Enoch Drebber! Does this name mean something? Members of the jury seem flustered. Not a name any scientist wishes to hear, that man's an abomination. Not a name any Ken Conjurer wishes to hear either. Who on earth is he? I'm afraid this isn't the first tale of this nature that I've heard in scientific circles in connection with that name. Let's talk of another flamboyant, of other flamboyant experiments that turn out to be nothing but stage trickery in the end. Obviously, the rascal is after the government's research grant money. When magicians are in need of money, I've heard, I'd have heard of them resorting to these underhanded tactics. Some acquaintances of mine with experience of such things have mentioned Enoch Drebber's name before. The man is both an engineer and a magician. Yes, we're dealing with an unparalleled confidence trickster here. That's Enoch Drebber for you. Oh. So Susato is just here now. That's good, okay. So it's true then. My invention, my great machine. It was just a grand, al grand illusion. Considering what we've just heard about Mr. Drebber's character, I'm sorry to say that sounds increasingly likely. Even though no one else believed it, I wanted to. I wanted to believe that machine would function exactly as my hypothesis predicted. Which is why you were so opposed to it being investigated, I presume? 
I know that if the machine was examined in detail, its construction would give away my hypothesis. Obviously, it didn't, I didn't want that to happen, but at the same time... I knew that if it was found to be nothing more than a trick than a work of deception, that everything I'd worked towards, all my research, all my dreams, my whole life would be over. I was terrified at the prospect. So you really had no idea then, did you? About the na true nature of the machine that was built? I never questioned anything. I didn't want to question it. It's entirely possible that Mr. Asman and Mr. Drebber were working together to use you as a means of fraudulently acquiring the research grant money. When I announced my invention to the crowds that day, it was the finest moment of my career! I pulled all the levers and turned all the dials in exactly the way Drebber had described. When the smoke just suddenly started billowing out, I panicked. I didn't know what was happening. But I really don't know how the illusion was made to work. I don't know anything anymore. Let me confirm one final point with you, Professor. Do you now consent to the prosecution submitting the necessary paperwork to release your invention from the protection afforded by the Special Dispensation for Scientific Equipment Act? Yes, please, go ahead. I'm very sorry. It appeared that we will have to suspend proceedings for the remainder of the day now. Lord Van Zeeks. My lord. The court has been newly been has newly been made aware of another party whose involvement in this matter is crucial. Yes, Mr. Drebber. Gather information about this man. If possible, I should like him served with the subpoena. With pleasure, my lord. Now, counsel for the defense. Yes, my lord! When we reconvene, I shall be looking for one thing and one thing alone from you. Evidence that the defendant is innocent of the crime for which he presently stands accused. I understand. Good. In that case, this court is adjourned until tomorrow morning. Here we go! Woo! I better get Sholmes' help from here. I'm gonna need it. Mr. Naruto! Ah, uh, yeah? Hi, I'm... I'm so sorry! I was wrong! You were right! I tricked you! You trusted me! I dragged you into my mess! Uh, how did I hit? How did I ever come to this? I'm so, so, so sorry! Did you really have no idea, Professor? About what Mr. Drebber really was up to, I mean? About what he was really constructing? Naturally! That machine was the embodiment of my hypothesis of all my hopes and dreams! I had complete faith in it! All right, in that case, I won't say any more. Now, sadly, the murder ac accusation against you still stands. So we, much, we must do an investigation, as much investigation as we can before tomorrow's trial resumes. Well, thank you for doing so much for me. Ah, Sisato. So sorry for arriving late this morning, Mr. Naruto. Arriving late. Didn't you receive my postcard? I wanted to let you know when I'd arrive. Postcard. What postcard? I hid it from you, Runo, so it would be a surprise. Oh, that's the surprise.
Well, did it work? I was surprised, all right, especially when she threw me to the ground. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. I was just so happy to see you again that I... It sort of slipped out that I threw you? Okay. Maybe we could stick to more traditional displays of emotion in the future. Susie's train was late into London Victoria this morning, you see. But we made the coachman really whip the horses hard so that she didn't miss the whole trial. And I was watching from the gallery for a while, but in the end I'm afraid I couldn't contain myself. I'm glad you didn't. Having you at my side in court gives me the strength I need to win. So, I'm, um, delighted to see you back in London. Oh, you're too kind, Mr. Naruhudo. I'm delighted to be here. I hope I can continue to be of service to you. Of course, so what's brought you back? Did Professor Mikotoba not protest? Let's save all that conversation for when we're back at home, shall we? You know, I've made one of my most special blends ever for this special occasion. Oh, Iris, how wonderful. I can't wait. Oh, God. Sisaru-san was back in London. It's hard to describe how happy that made me feel at the time, but despite my elation, our tale was about to take yet another extraordinary turn. Was it now? Investigation part two. Oh Lord, we back. Oh, this room, it's been too long. It hasn't changed in the slightest though. It's been some six months, hasn't it? That's a long time for things to stay so familiar. I didn't know when you might return, so I wanted everything to be as you left it. But it has been some six months, it's true. Uh, uh, chat, when it comes to spoiling other games, it's not just for me, to clarify. You don't put other game spoilers in the chat because you don't assume that everybody in the chat has played the same games that you have. Not everybody in this chat has played other, uh, let's just say Ace Attorney games. I'm sure I'm not the only one in here. It's not just for my sake, it's for everybody's sake. It's like a common courtesy. You don't assume that people have played other games. So it doesn't just ruin my experience if I see it, it ruins other people's experiences in the chat. Keep that in mind, please. Is your father all right, Susie? What happened? My father? Oh, yes, Professor Mikotoba, I mean, it was half a year ago, but that's why you went back to Japan. Because of the telegram you received saying he'd fallen ill with a high, very high fever some, for some unknown reason? That's right. So I was surprised to learn that you'd be coming back so soon. Surprised, but happy. I think I wrote about it in my letter to you that it was all a trick. My father is in fine health, and I'm obviously very relieved about that. Well, we're all delighted to have you back. It was quite by accident that I've been able to return to Europe, actually. It's because of a very grand conference called the International Forensic Science Symposium. The International Forensic... That's the same sy symposium Lord Strongheart mentioned. Anyway, I've arrived safe and sound, and all that matters is that I'm here now. After all, I haven't f yet fulfilled my promise to you, Iris. Oh? You must tell us everything that happened while you were back in Japan. Yes, of course I shall. And there's one thing. Something you wrote in your letter that particularly grabbed my attention. About you know who? I know. I'll tell you all that I can. Uh, 
Okay. Just remind me, I'm debating on like when to say my theory. And I'm going to save it until after this information, just in case it might alter what my theory is. Back in Britain. When I first arrived back in Japan, I really thought that I'd never be allowed to return to Britain. But curiously, after that awful trial at the Supreme Court, Father's mood changed entirely. The awful trial, oh yeah, for the murder of Giselle Brett. Oh, you dressed as a man then, didn't you, Susie? Oh, um, well, yes, uh, since women are forbidden in the courtroom, I had no choice. Wow, amazing! I wish I'd seen it, don't you, Runa? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> I want to play at being a lawyer now. I could wear a false mustache, maybe. I don't think any mustache could hide the fact that you're just 10 years old, Iris. <laughs> There's something else I've been wanting to ask you, Mrs. Sato. It's about the real reason why Professor Mikotoba summoned you back to Japan. You said in your letter it was something to do with that convict's loot, which was found in Mr. Natsume's lodgings. The very large dog collar we found with the B emblem on it. It seems Mr. Natsume included a drawing of the, of the collar in the report he submitted about his time in Britain. I understand that when Father saw the report, he turned as white as a sheet. Why would that be? Father came to Britain himself, of course, to study. It was some time ago now, but he stayed for six years. How long ago? I can only imagine that something must have happened during that time. But if he refuses to tell me what it was, then I intend to find the answers for myself. I've decided that, for one, I won't keep any more secrets. Oh, Susie! That's a very meaningful look Susato-san's giving Iris there. Lord Strongheart mentioned something about that symposium, too. I think he said that investigative authorities from 40 different countries would attend. From Japan, my father and Judge Jujoku have been invited. It's something of an honor, I believe. Well, Professor Mikotoba is the leading expert in forensic medicine in our country, after all. But who's the other person you mentioned? A judge, did you say? His Excellency, Judge Seishiro Jigoku. You've met him, Mr. Naruto. Last year, in the Supreme Court. You can't possibly have forgotten. The terrible trial of yours when you were accused of murder? Ah, uh, yeah, I try, to, I try to think of that as a positive turning point in my life these days. Well, it was Judge Jigoku who presided over, over that trial. If I'm perfectly honest, I'd be happy to never see that faint man's face again in my life. Well, oh, well, anyway, as father was invited to the symposium, he agreed to me returning to Britain, too. He won't actually arrive until next month, but, well, I couldn't wait. So, I pleaded with him in the end, he agreed to me going on ahead. Ah, yes, about the symposium. It seems as though Lord Strongheart has put an awful lot of work to make it happen. It obviously is very important. I believe it is, yes. As I understand it, Lord Strongheart organized the entire event himself. Ah, Max! You're cute, Max. Thank you so much for the raid. I appreciate it. And I hope you had a really, really great stream. I love you, Biz. I think he's hoping that by achieving exceptional results, he'll get the job of Attorney General. The most senior position in the British justice system. He's hoping to use his power to create the world's finest policing institution. That's what Father said anyway. Apparently, it's Lord Strongheart's lifelong ambition. Does Professor Mikotoba know Lord Strongheart personally then, I wonder? Hell yeah, he does. Actually, Lord Strongheart gave me a long speech all about this very subject only yesterday. Whoa! 
of theories. Ah, for later. Theories for later. I sort of lost the will to live early on and didn't really listen to much of it. How trying for you. Hi, Max. Giselle Brett. The woman whose unforgivable actions ended in me being wrongly accused of a crime I didn't commit. The murder of Dr. John H. Wilson. Yes, Giselle Brett. That's a name I won't forget for as long as I live. But the extraordinary thing is, though, it seems it's a name we should all forget. Sorry? Since the incident, our government's intelligence services have been investigating Miss Brett. It turns out that an English woman by the name of Giselle Brett didn't actually exist. Didn't exist, but how can that be? It was a pseudonym. Her real name was Shin, and she was a visiting student either. Fucking called it, man! Duh! I knew Shin was a character that we already knew. I had a couple theories about who it was gonna be. Giselle Brett was one of them. It wasn't my top pick, though, for who Shin was. I had a feeling my first guess was actually Hosunaga for a second. Ooh, okay. That was a front. Who on earth was she then? Miss A. Shin. Her name is literally all our intelligence services have been able to ascertain about her. Nobody knows why or even why she came to be in Japan. It's a complete mystery. That makes no sense. It's no easy task to be accepted into a, as a foreign exchange student anywhere. What could the woman have been up to? I'm afraid I really don't know. The only thing we can be sure of is that she had some business in our country that we don't yet understand. And now she's been killed. While all the questions surrounding her existence remain unanswered. I'm afraid so. Who on earth was she? Why do I feel as though I've heard that name before somewhere? Oof. If we are to assume that is a hit list. Gregson is the only one left alive. But why? I feel like this is about the time I, I put my theory forward. Okay. And this actually gives me supporting evidence of my theory, surprisingly. Okay. Please don't laugh at me. Okay. I am almost certain I am, I am very positive about this. Ooh, maybe I'm not so certain. I'm doubting myself now that I'm saying it out loud. Oh God. The moment that I saw the hooded figure, the apprentice of Mr. Varen von Zeeks, Ver Beric von Zeeks. Oh my God, I can't say his name anymore. I had a feeling that I knew who he was. I mentioned... First off, at first glance, I, I felt that he was a Japanese man. And 
you could make the argument and say, well, Ver Beric von Zeeks doesn't like the Japanese. Why would he have a Japanese apprentice? Well, he was appointed by Strongheart. He wasn't appointed by Beric von Zeeks. Von Zeeks just has to deal with it. I... <sighs> I have a very strong suspicion that this man... At first, at first, I was like, it's Cosma, but he's very dead. My hands are shaking. <laughs> the... Mm. I'm wondering... If it is like okay, this is this is a this is a this is, this, is, this, is, this is like an anime game, right? <laughs> he's been here for a while, this man, and he's been in secret for a long time. I would I would like to know how long this apprentice has been here to support my theory, but I think that it is absolutely a relative of Kazuma. I feel like I can say that with like ninety percent certainty. I think that he is a relative of some sort to Kazuma. And I, if I want to be more specific, I think that he looked young. He looked young. So I want to say that Kazuma had a brother, a twin brother. And I'm gonna go a little further, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All of the people on the hit list are British, except for Kazuma. Could his family have been British? It's weird because he's the only one on that list that isn't. So with the news of now that I have of Giselle Brett being Shin on the hit list, who's also British, I'm that does lead me to believe that Kazuma, who's the only non-British person on that list, maybe has a background in Britain. Which maybe uh, gives a little bit of supporting evidence as to why he was specifically being sent to, to Britain. Not exactly sure why yet. But... Was he being sent to acquire his brother who was trapped there? I don't know. It's a little bit weird. Especially now I have to consider the fact that Lord Strongheart and Professor Mikotoba are either working together or they are not. I don't actually know. I'm a little bit stumped on that right now. But another thing I'm fairly certain about now is that I do think that Sholmes also knows Professor Mikotoba. There's that, too. I am pretty sure about that. I have to think about that point for a little bit longer, but... We, okay, there's so many key things that we have to, we have to know. I have so many thoughts. I'm sorry it's so hard for me to pin down every single thought. There's a lot of baggage. Sholmes was in Japan. I don't know why, I don't know when, I don't know if he went with Wilson. At all. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly the relation that he has with Professor Mikotoba, but I... Oh... I, I guess I shouldn't assume. This is a giant assumption that I have that Sholmes knows Mikotoba. That is a big assumption. Maybe I shouldn't assume that. 
Maybe I'll dial back on that point, but I still think it's really, 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 really plausible. And Sholmes has already stated that he does not like Strongheart, which can only be bad. I don't see how that in any way, shape, or form can be good. If Sholmes says somebody is bad and he doesn't like somebody, hmm, I feel like that's telling. What's the relation between Mikotoba and Strongheart then? Ooh, uh, talking about forensic science and that being like the key tie, I'm not so sure. Wilson was studying forensic science. Giselle Brett A. Shin was studying forensic science. Gregson doesn't fit into that bill. Cosma also doesn't fit into that bill. So for a while I was looking at the list and like trying to find a commonality between the, these four people. And the only uh, thing I can get a commonality between them is uh, the fact that they're British, except for Cosmo, but I feel like his family is British. Hence my theory about his twin brother being the hooded figure that is the apprentice of Lord Van Zeeks. I'm just gonna leave my theories there. Where I'm, I'll be honest, where I'm stumped is that, like, I feel, I feel like I can trust Mikotoba in a sense. The professor, I, d um, there's like, a, there's like a small, small, small part that wants to trust him. I genuinely think Lord Strongheart is a bad person. Genuinely feel that way. There might be some blackmail going on. I have to also consider that. The fact that the judge, Jigoku, now is involved. Jigoku and Professor Mikotoba are friends. They've said that already. And then they also know Strongheart, but are they with or against? It's very interesting. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm rambling a lot. But there you have it. I guess the main point of my theory was the identity of the hooded figure. Based on the... I was first astounded by his posture, the fact that he was sitting on the ground and very astute. Um... Uh, I do think that he's Japanese, and then the familiarity in his posture reminded me of Kazuma almost instantly. And... But Kazuma's dead? So I think it's like a twin brother, or maybe Kazuma's not dead, but I'm pretty sure that he is. Like, he's just... He's on the hit list, he's dead. So, yeah, twin brother, I'm calling that. Um... If he's not, like, a twin brother he's just some sort of a relative that's that's what i'm going on right now okay end of rant end of theory i just put a lot out there but yes there's a lot in my mind right now <laughs> i'm gonna try to find the link between sholms and mikotoba i think uh that's what i'm gonna go for i think there is something there i want to know why sholms was in japan really bad right now but I don't know when and if Sholmes is actually going to talk about that, so we'll see. We'll see if also Suzato right now talks about the Hound of the Baskervilles. I feel like that'll help me a lot, too. We'll see. Let's move on, finally. After my friend Ray's trial, the reporter who actually killed Miss Brett says something very strange. You know the truth! You had- you know you had a hand in it when it went on! And that visiting student's fate! Nobody here in Japan knows anything about it! They don't know that the guy never made it to England, that he died on that steamship, and that he'll never- Obviously, I couldn't ask him to elaborate at the time. But later, I visited the man in his prison cell and asked him what, was he, was, what he was going to say about Kazuma-sama.
after he died on the voyage to Great Britain. His body should have been unladen at the port of Hong Kong and passed it into the care of the consulate staff there. Should have been. Well, it turns out that his body never arrived. It just disappeared. Cosmo's body vanished. Our government tried to cover that fact up, it seems. They erected a grave on the cliffs of our, by our hometown. Except Cosmo-sama isn't there. Did Professor Mikotoba know about this? Yes, it would seem that he did. He didn't tell me. They're still investigating what happened to Cosmo Sama's body as we speak. Don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. I'm gonna scream! I'm gonna scream! Don't do it! What is this acute feeling of apprehension I have all of a sudden? <sighs> breathe, Crystal! Breathe! Twin brother, my ass! Thinking back now, some of the things that happened on the SS Burya were definitely strange. I mean, after he died, we never saw his body again, did we? Could it be... that he's actually still alive? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Just thinking about the possibility pains me so very much. Cast your mind back for a moment, Mr. Narhodo. When Kazuma Sama was discovered, Mr. Sholmes was there, wasn't he? Finally, we're discussing this. And he definitely examined the body. I remember it clearly. Don't point Sholmes to be bad. I know where you're going with this and stop right there. So if Cosma hadn't actually been dead at all, it would mean that Mr. Sholmes had lied. There's no reason why he would have possibly done such a thing. I suppose that's true, yeah. But of course, she knows more. The idea that he might still be alive somewhere he wants to fill me with hope, but I can't let it, because if it turned out not to be true, then I'd be back at the bottom of that awful pit of despair again. I'm terrified of what that might do to me. I am... My hand is shaking. <laughs> Miss Asado. I know she's given the idea that the thought it de the thought it deserves. It's Sasada-san we're talking about, after all. So I probably shouldn't push it now. It must be about a year ago now. I wrote a really long story based on some of Father's old notes. It's about one of Hardy's greatest exploits. I called it the Hound of the Baskervilles. But then Mr. Sholmes forbade you from publishing it. And put the manuscript somewhere nobody could get their hands on it. So nobody knows about any of it, apart from Hurley and I. 
But for some reason, you knew the title of it, didn't you, Susie? Sounds so exciting! The Hound of the Baskervilles, I should love to read it. And you wouldn't tell me, how'd you come to know it? Yes, but I made you promise, I made a promise to you that I would explain one day, didn't I? I think it's time. I'm only sorry I had to keep it from you for so long, Iris. I have a new immediate thought. D do I think that Sholmes knows the hit list of four people before we actually found out? Or was that new information for him? I'm just thinking of the possibility of him knowing Kazuma before the incident, claiming his body to be dead so that he would inevitably, in, in a way, it would protect him. Because if Kazuma was, a, was dead on all accounts, that would take him off of the hit list, wouldn't it? It would be a way of protecting him. How would he know? He could literally only know if he had dealings with Professor Mikotoba, because Professor Mikotoba is the only person that gave Kazuma an inkling about his own death. The only way Kazuma knew that something bad was going to happen to him was because of Mikotoba. And that's a common link between Sholmes and Kazuma in that case. Oh my god. Sholmes isn't bad. He's trying to protect Kazuma. But I wonder if he knows where his body ended up. Did he arrange that? He would have had to arrange that. He wouldn't have just let it happen. What is happening? He wouldn't just let Kazuma start working as an apprentice for Beric von Zeeks. He wouldn't just let that happen. Oh my god. What is happening? <laughs> It was completely by accident that I came to know the title of your manuscript, Iris. It was a short while before we left Japan. I was cleaning Father's study and I saw something on his writing desk. A large... <coughs> a large box of papers. There was a label affixed... Affixed... Uh, affixed... <laughs> affixed to the box that was written in English, it read. The Hound of the Baskervilles. My Baskerville story! Of course, I had no idea what it was at the time, but Father came in and... Sisoto, what are you doing? Is Shom stopping this? Oh, okay. Uh, this is past tense. I was like, oh my god. Father! Did you look at those papers? Uh, no, no, I simply read the label, that's all. Well, put it out of your mind. Sorry? Forget that you ever saw it, and certainly don't tell anybody else about this. Do you understand? Oh my god. I'm so stupid. I didn't think about the simplest thing. I didn't think about the simplest thing. 
Mikatoba was the person who invited Wilson to the f Japan in the first place. Of course, if he's the one that invited Wilson to Japan to study abroad in the first place, of course he knows Sholmes. Of course he would know his partner. The Hound of the Baskervilles. I wonder if this whole case took place in Japan. <coughs> but, might not have. Because if they just said that Mikotoba came to Britain for study abroad a while ago... Maybe the three of them worked together on cases. That wouldn't make any sense though, but... When I heard Iris mention the word Baskerville that day, the title just slipped out. I would never have guessed that it was an unpublished account of one of Mr. Sholmes's exploits. When I returned to Japan, I asked Father to explain. He refused to answer any of my questions, and there was no sign of the big box in his office. Because Sholmes took it. I have no doubt that Father has a very good reason for being so secretive about it, but still. I made up my mind to explain myself to both of you. Thank you for being so honest, Susie. Mr. Naruto, I'm ready to start investigating if you are. I've committed every detail about the case to memory. And Iris has told me about the disturbing happenings at the Waxwork Museum as well. You're fully abreast of the situation already, Mrs. Sato. I've expected nothing less, to be honest. I need... to drink. Holy shit. I think our first port of call should be to investigate this Mr. Drebber. The engineer responsible for building the elaborate machine that was used to effect this extraordinary trick. A conjurer of some sorts, by the sound of it, well known in the fields of science. My brain... My brain is no longer in this case at all. I am done with this case. I'm mentally over it. I cannot think about it anymore. We need to go and arrest him! Okay, Sasato! Well, yes! I know that he must- he must know the truth behind the case, so I agree we really need to find the man! Sounds like it's a case of tracking someone down. Which is a job for the police, or a great detective. Are we supposed to guess who she might be thinking of? We don't have much time, so we need to get started straight away, I think. You're not coming today? I'm going to Brixton Road shortly after for, shortly for the herb market. But let me know later how you got on, won't you? That was a little abrupt. The pull of the herb market must be strong. Do you know? I honestly thought I might never have the opportunity to, ha to return to Great Britain. What is this, like, thing? And certainly not so soon. It's funny, for the past six months I haven't been able to work in court. Meanwhile, you've been raising a storm in the Supreme Court of Judicature back in Japan! Please, Mr. Naruto, I may have been dressed as a man, but it was a very reverse, uh, reserved performance. So, what your father said in his letter about a Ryart, Ryutoro takedown is reserved? 
Well, anyway, I'm back here in this great capital now and ready to assist you again in any way I can. Thank you, Mrs. Sato. My pleasure, Mr. Naruto. Hey, Sasato, look at my armband. You're still taking good care of that armband, I see. I'm so pleased. I'm, I feels like I wouldn't be me without it now, to be honest. Oh dear, there seems to be a thread coming loose just there. Look! I'd be only too happy to mend it for you, Mr. Naruto. Oh, thank you. I must have scraped it against something again. I'm always doing that. Then take better care of it, please. It was all going so well until I ruined it. I just wanted to present it, you know. A new location has been added! I can't go to the prosecutor's office! No! Sholmes, are you home? Of course he's not. Not like he would talk ever anyway. Whatever. So many places to go. I'm actually gonna go everywhere. Uh. Oh! The white-haired... Hi! Who's that standing behind, beside Lord Strongheart? I wonder, I've never seen her before. Ah, the young champion of the court. You had some success this morning, I understand. And you've thrown the entire government into disarray as a result. You mean because of Professor Harebrain's experiment? Sham science being demonstrated in Lon at London's Great Exhibition. The country has been made to look foolish, and now politicians are scrabbling to respond. Lord Van Zeeks is in Whitehall as we speak, giving an emergency briefing. Oh dear, I am- um, I didn't mean to cause any trouble. None of this is your responsibility. The government is entirely to blame for having been taken in. The special dis- the, the special dispensation that prevents investigation at the scene will be annulled later today. Once that happens, my forensic investigation team will move in and deal with that scrap metal in no time. Scrap metal. Until later then, my Lord Strongheart. I like your design. Can I have it? Who was that? That was Dr. Courtney Sith, Scotland Yard's esteemed chief coroner. She's leading the forensic investigation team handling of this case. She was just delivering her report about the victim, in fact. I see about Mr. Asman. Following the outcome of the trial earlier, I asked the coroner's office to reevaluate its findings. I don't have time to tell you what she concluded. If you want to know, you'll have to ask her directly. You can find her in the forensics laboratory. Ah, uh, right. Now, what were you here to see me about? I can give you 7 minutes and 39 seconds of my time. Ah, he's not running quite so spectacularly late anymore. What exactly is the forensic investigation team that you mentioned before? The British Empire police force must become the most exemplary in the world. 
For that to happen, it's imperative that we embrace forensic science and everything it has to offer. I first created the forensic investigation team a year ago, now unofficially, of course, to pave the way. Goodness, a year ago? At next month's symposium, I intend to present the results of their work to the world. Once I do that, the House of Lords will be powerless to oppose the creation of a full-scale forensics division. And once that happens, the position of Attorney General will be mine, and criminals will suffer dearly. What do you mean? For too long, those scoundrels have made a mockery of our legal system with false evidence and bribes. But London scum is about to be rounded up and burnt in the fires of hell. I intend to see to it personally. By creating the finest police force the world has ever known to protect our honor and our future. Look at those eyes, he means every word. Dr. Sith is an extremely reliable coroner. When I officially establish the forensics division at Scotland Yard, she will run it as my right-hand woman. Now then, speaking of the symposium, Miss Mikatoba. Um, my lord. Your father should be on the high seas as we speak, making his way here to represent the Empire of Japan. Yes, that's right. I understand he'll arrive at, at the beginning of next month. Are you acquainted, Lord Strongheart? With Professor Mikotoba? It was many years ago now, but yes. I remember Dr. Mikotoba very well. If my memory serves, it was some 15 years ago now that your father came to Britain as a visiting student. It was the year I was born, so yes, 16 years ago, in fact. Mikitoba was a young practitioner of forensic science, and Jigoku accompanied him as a young, promising judge. The punctiliousness and politeness of the Japanese at the time impressed us greatly. Not that I wish to imply impoliteness or carelessness on your part in any way. I didn't think that you were. Dr. Mikitoba studied forensics at one of London's large hospitals. St. Sinners, if I'm not mistaken. Dr. Sith was also there then, as it happens. Then Dr. Sith knows my father too, does she? She was a young medical assistant at the time, so I doubt their paths crossed regularly. But I've no doubt that they knew each other superficially. After all, Dr. Mikitoba was st here studying his subject for some 10 years in total. Six years. Six years? That's a long time to be studying abroad, isn't it? I lived with my grandmother in those years. So he left his newly born daughter behind and went overseas for six whole years. It was a rather turbulent time at home. Oh. Perhaps father wanted a reason to get away. What do you mean? Why? Well, clearly something was going on at the time. I wanted to ask you about Lord Van Zeeks, actually. I heard that his older brother was killed some years ago by a mass murderer known as the Professor who targets n targeted nobles and royalty. Is that right? You Japanese are a thorough lot. You've done your research well. Yes. And you could say it was that very incident that gave rise to the Reaper. Why? When his brother Clint Van Zeeks was murdered, it was just after young Beric had graduated from the University of London and became a prosecutor. When obvious criminals who managed to evade conviction in court started disappearing, Rumors quickly spread throughout the capital. Londoners started to say that whenever, wherever Beric von Zeeks went, the ghost of his dead brother wasn't far behind. Oh 
my word. So Lord Van Zeeks isn't the Reaper, it's the ghost of his brother. Ever since that time, he became a very aloof figure in London's legal circles. Oh yes, Lord Strongheart! It's about Professor Harebrain's experimental machine. We'd like your permission to examine the remains if possible. Are you well versed in science then? Uh, not in the slightest. In fact, you could say I was barely aware of the subject at all until recently. Well, the special disp dispensation legally preventing investigation of the machine is currently being annulled. Within a few hours, Dr. Sin's team of forensic experts will begin their own investigation. But I suppose until then, there's no harm in you looking at the wreckage as long as you touch nothing. Thank you! Being able to look at it is better than nothing. I'll be able to see it too. Your time is up. You'll have to excuse me now, I'm afraid. My next engagement calls. We are extremely sorry to have troubled you with all when you're so busy, my lord. I have important matters to attend to in preparation for the symposium, you understand. Oh boy! To the prison! I'm going everywhere. You can't stop me, bitch. Holy! Oh my god. Oh my, the whole wall is uh, the cell is covered in mathematical equations. And he's still writing more now. Uh, professor, sorry to interrupt. Oh, uh, Mr. Naruto. Uh, who is this young lady? My name is Sasato Mikotoba. I'm Mr. Naruto's judicial assistant. It's a pleasure to meet you, Professor. Like you, uh, sooner. None of this would have happened. <laughs> no, 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 that's not logical. That makes no sense at all. Oh dear, I'm sorry if my presence here upsets you. I owe you an apology too, Professor. I didn't manage to deliver what I promised you I would in court this morning. Oh, no, 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 no. The whole thing, the whole miserable affair. It all happened because of... I've been such a complete nut a clot! Um, Professor Harebrain? What have you been working on in your cell? Oh, ha ha ha, um, uh, you mean that? Oh dear, how embarrassing. And I was suddenly struck by an idea, you see. I simply had to write it down. The wall was all I had in hand, hand to hand. Oh, is it some new hypothesis? Something to surpass? Super high voltage instantaneous kinesis, maybe? Oh, uh, no, actually, this, uh, this is my autobiography. Your autobiography. Oh, I was diddled and fiddled by Albert Hairbrain! I found I could repress my odd fortunes with only odd numbers and an ambitious set of simultaneous equations! Really? I'm going to have to pay back all the loans I took back for the kinesis machine, you see? And it's going to be a new serial publication for next month, part one, an odd birth and an odd upbringing. You can't beat the man's optimism, that's for sure. Well, for now, would you mind if we talked a little more about the case? Oh, yes, yes, of course! I've been working through the numbers. I was diddled, I was fiddled by the pair of them! By Asmin and by that aloof engineer, Drebber. We're not gonna have to sit through an explanation of all these equations, are we? Everything I believed in has been turned on its head. 
My research, Mr. Asbin, the kinesis machine. My hypothesis, even. I'm sorry it's come to this. There really was no other way. No, no, it's not your fault. I wanted to protect my work, but in the end, there was nothing worth protecting. It was never my intention to deceive anyone. I didn't want to trick the public. No, of course you didn't. But in court this morning, I realized something. If you've done something wrong without knowing it, you've still done something wrong! Logically, it makes no difference if you are aware of it or not. Ignorance is a poor excuse. The blame still lies with me. Oh, Professor. He believed in me this morning, you know. Barrick did. He believed in my hypothesis. Well, I think... That was just a necessary factor in the prosecution establishing its case. No, no, Beric wouldn't do something like that. I'm sure he genuinely believed it. Did he? I think I understand now. Why it was that he decided to take on the prosecution in my trial, I mean. I'm biting. After the terrible accident happened, nobody would believe in my hypothesis anymore. Not the police, not the prosecution service, not even lawyers! I feel like I dealt some kind of finishing blow there. If any other prosecutor had taken this case, if it was anyone other than Barrick, I'm sure the prosecution would have declared my hypothesis a complete and utter nonsense. And in that case, you would have been declared a fraud yourself, Professor. Exactly, which would have been a fate worse than death for me. But Beric insisted that I was a proper man of science from start to finish. You think that's why he... I know him very well indeed. He's an extremely kind-hearted soul. But that extreme kind-hearted soul... Spent all morning trying to paint you as a murderer, didn't he? Well, admittedly, that part of the analysis appears to have some flaws in it. What about the whole Reaper side of things? How does that fit in with the whole kind-hearted soul idea? Uh, do, do you think he set out to trick me from the very start? I'm sorry to say, that does seem very likely, yeah. When I first met him, he introduced himself as a wealthy financier. He looked over the paper I'd written and said my work would benefit all humanity and must be pursued. He was so enthused! He was so emphatic! But in reality, he was the mastermind of some vast criminal network, it seems. I still can't believe it! as the machine was essentially a set decoration for some stage magic. It probably didn't require a large amount of investment, actually. But the scale of it, it wasn't just some small trick. It was a very elaborate feat of deception. All young scientists are full of hope about their burgeoning ideas, full of zeal. But none of us have any money! We want to do our research, but we can't afford it! Many of us take on barely legal part-time work, to try to earn just a few measly pennies to carry on! To go through all of that, only to be taken for a complete fool! It's too rotten to believe. It is, I agree. And that's why we have to find those responsible and bring them to justice. Mr. Asman is no more, of course, which leaves only the engineer. Mr. Enoch Drebber. Is he an engineer, or a magician, or a swindler? It was about a year ago when Mr. Asman first brought Drebber to meet me at my laboratory. Since then, I've met him many times to discuss details about the kinesis machine. But at no point did you have any inkling that he was just an illusionist? Ah, he definitely wasn't just an illusionist. What do you mean? He was a wealth of deep scientific knowledge. There's no question that the man's a genuine scientist. He's instantly ap apparent in conversation. Ah, uh, I see. But the wretched man deceived you, Professor. It's unforgivable. We must do everything we can to find him and bring him to justice. 
Are there no more clues you can give us as to his whereabouts? I'm sorry. We only ever discussed the kinesis machine, nothing else. Hmm. Although, just once. He did visit his workshop. I did visit his workshop. What workshop? Drebber's enormous fabrication laboratory where he constructed my giant machine. Oh? Why didn't you mention this before? Enoch Drebber's workshop? That's every... There's every chance we might find the man there. What the fuck? So, you've been to Drebber's place of work then? Yes, just once, you understand? It was an enormous place. Plenty of room to construct the kinesis machine, you see? Where can we find it? We have to go there at once. There's a good chance that we'll find Drebber there. Well, yes, definitely, I'm sure. As in, I'm sure you're not going to want to hear this. But I have absolutely no idea where the workshop is at all. Okay. I'm so sorry! I was more than half expecting that. Oh, you see, I was blindfolded in the carriage the entire way there. He blindfolded you? He wasn't taking any chances then. The place was incredible, the pinnacle of modern engineering. Even the oil he used was the very best, a special French machine oil that's impossible to obtain in Britain. Ah, the indescribable scent of the, that imported oil. Perfumers across the world should forget their secret formula and use this instead. What do you think, Miss Sasato? You did machine for your next birthday? I've never used any kind of perfume, Mr. Naruto, and I'm not sure I'd like to start with that. I don't suppose you know even part of the workshop's address, Professor? You don't have a business card for Mr. Drebber, for example? The man was clearly very cautious. Oh, yes I do! He gave me his business card once! It's right here! Look! What? Let me see that! Throw etiquette to the wind, why don't you? Fucking Sasato? Enoch Drebber, engineer. I'm afraid that's all it says. There's no address. I can't say I'm surprised. Still, this could be useful. smudge here. I think perhaps it's machine oil. Ah, oh, yes, probably. Professor Harebrains mentioned something about the oil Mr. Drepper uses, didn't he? He said it was specifically imported very high quality oil that's impossible to obtain in Britain. Oh, yes, that's right, but more importantly that it's more fragrant than the finest perfume, so excuse me for a moment. It doesn't appear to have any scent at all. Don't worry, I expect that's just because there's a tiny amount on here. present it back with the oil. Okay, no. It's nothing to do with your hypothesis. Take it away! I don't want to be bothered with anything that doesn't assist my science. Keep your abundant hair on. Oh my god, guy. Just calm down. All right. Two... The experimentation stage. Ah! Ah! That was so cute! 
had no idea that there were so many people in the world. I know what you mean, it's really packed here today. It feels as though it's taken us two hours just to make our way through the crowds to this point. Has it? I shut my brain down so I didn't really notice to be honest. Gosh, I do wish I had your absence of mind sometimes, Mr. Naruto. There you are. I had a feeling you lot would show your mugs before long. Oh, that's not Gina. That's embarrassing. Wow, Mr. Gregson, you're sounding mighty girlish and... Yep, today. I see you're hard at work as usual! Warm greetings to you. I do hope that you've been keeping well since we last met. What's with all the ceremony? We just saw each other in court this morning. Not you, sunshine, the gentlewoman so loyally at your side. Oh, why thank you, Inspector. How good of you to notice. <laughs> he might be a bit rough around the edges, but he's still a proper English gentleman at heart, I suppose. As you've probably guessed, we were hoping to investigate the scene some more. All right, well, that's the young trainee's domain. Oi, get over here, Gina! She seems to be busy playing with a puppy. Probably giving it a traditional East End training. Gina, she's a police officer now. Amazing, isn't it? She's a good kid, actually. Her heart's in the right place, anyway. She's got the deduction bug. Detection bug, if you ask me. Yep, I think she'll follow in my footsteps nicely. What do you mean? He knows he's gonna die. I'm being transferred. It's time for me to say toodaloo to London. Really? That's a bit sudden. I had no idea. Where are you going to be posted? We'll come to see you how you're getting along. Not likely, but you're welcome to try. If you don't mind, a trip to France, that is. France. I'm working in the Paris Police Prefecture. Should be right up my alley. But France! It's entirely a different country! I don't understand. Why would you be sent there? To be murdered, that's why. That's the way the adult world works, sunshine. Now don't go poking your nose in where it's not wanted. I'm intending to take the kid with me. No! Gina! What? You're taking Gina to Paris? I can't leave her here in London. Who knows what would become of her? I suppose he's worried that she'd slip back into slipping her hands into people's pockets and purses. I don't think he's worried about her pickpocketing, Mr. Naruto. I think he's worried about the Reaper. Oh, of course. So that's playing on Inspector Gregson's mind too, is it? Gregson is a good bean. He can't die. We must protect Inspector Gregson, chat. We must protect him! We will! He cannot go to France! He'll die! I haven't mentioned any of this to Gina, so don't go blabbing, you hear me? Uh, no, of course not. I've got to keep that diving diva safe and sound. Until all this is over, at least. Oi! Did you just call me a blooming diva? Diving Diva again? Oh, so you heard that, did ya? Right, well. Any questions about the scene? You can put them into my capable Detective Diva here. Alright, you heard the boss. Inspector Lestrade in charge here now. She's so cute, I love her. I suppose I'd better keep my word and not mention anything about Paris. So, um, Gina, you've got a new dog, have you? Oh, isn't he great? Toby is his name. Oh, how delightful. He's absolutely adorable. Yes, the dog does seem lovely. It's not so lovely, Inspector Gregson. That's playing on my mind, to be honest. I will kill for this dog. He's too cute. He is a cutie. Thank you for your joy, bits. <gasps> ah, he's so cute. Investigating the scene. 
Um, Gina, we were actually hoping that we could investigate the scene again. Yeah, all right. If it's around here, you can do what you like. Oh, that's all right? I'm gonna be playing with my new friend here. Ah, uh, yes, Toby. Oh. The machine that exploded must be at the top of those stairs, I presume. I haven't actually seen it yet, so if you don't mind... Sorry, you can't go up there, Suze. I'm going to kill this fuck. Oh. It's like I told Odo yesterday. Even I ain't allowed near that wreck. What's it called again? The reason we weren't supposed to touch it? The special... Special dispensation for the Scientific Equipment Act? Is that what you were thinking of? That's the one. That's why only them lot are allowed to investigate it. What are they called again? The forensic something? Forensic investigation team? Is that what you were thinking of? That's the one, yeah! Isn't it the case that the special dispensation has been lifted? I think so. I don't really get it, to be truthful with ya. You're still supposed to get permission from some bigwig or other as far as I know. What was his name again? Uh, Lord Strange something. I'm not sure that's quite right, Gina. I think you mean Lord Strongheart, perhaps. That's the one, yeah! Apparently he's Gina watching the time or something. Tom. Thank you for the five-month reset resub impulse. I appreciate it. Actually, we've just recently been to see Lord Strongheart. You what? You met him? Last time the boss was called to go and see him, he waited for three hours in the cove's office and came back sniffling. Tragic. Lord Strongheart has given us permission to examine the scene as long as we touch nothing. Oh yeah? Honestly. Alright then, go ahead. But if it turns out you're lying, it'll be the boss who gets it. He'll never eat another chip again in his life. So, you say, you're still saying all this is above board, are ya? I'm sure everything will be fine. That really would be tragic. All right then, them's are the upstairs. Off you go. Oh, thank you, Gina. It was great, wasn't it? I had a right laugh. It was a new one at me on me that. You know, being in court and uh, being court and not spending the whole time worrying if I'm being to be if I'm about to be found out. You did keep an awful lot of secrets in your all previous court appearances, didn't you? Yeah, and Odo's made things hard for me every single time and all. I like how Gina's like super proud. She's so cute. She's super proud that she's honest now. She's like, yeah, it felt good. So cute. Just doing my job, Gina. But watching someone else get it in the neck is a lot of fun, actually. It was amazing what you showed that dodgy professor's dodgy experiment was a total fix. The dodgy professor, as you put it, Gina, is Mr. Naruto's client. Yeah, I'm starting to wish that he wasn't, though. It's the boss I feel sorry for, sent off to do the impossible. What do you mean? He's supposed to arrest the other Kobe, eh, ain't he? A and in time for tomorrow and all. You know, the dodgy engineer, what's his name again? Mr. Drebber, you mean? Eno Enoch Drebber? That's the one, yeah! Mysterious man with the black monocle. It's putting too much on the boss, if you ask me. He says it's giving him a head, giving him a gut ache. Oh dear, but I do wonder if that isn't actually from all the fried food. The engineer's whereabouts. So Scotland Yard is trying to come, trying to track down Mr. Enoch Drebber. I wonder if they've any had any luck. He's really funny looking, got two eyes what don't match. Stole a glimpse of a picture of him earlier. I mean, I didn't actually pitch it and pitch it or nothing. The old devil's got it. Sorry, who? You know, that scowling reaper what's always lugging down glasses, that blood red plonk. Ah, Lord Van Zeeks. He's always had it in it for me, that cove. Don't know what he's always scowling about, mine. Probably would have been a good boss as it goes. 
She'd rather be the Reaper's apprentice than a detective's trainee? The way I see it, if the choice is between a chip-guzzling detective and a chalice-glugging demigod, you're equally bad off with both. I suppose you're right. I'm glad we've put that one to bed. Anyway, the point is, everyone at the Yard's Dead set on finding the fishy engineer. But there don't seem to be, ne be no clues to go on, so they're stuck. There's nothing that can lead us to Drebber at all? Oof. Toby the dog! Toby the dog! Where did you find that little mutt then, Gina? Boy, don't be claiming rude, Odo. Slight overreaction, don't you think? He ain't no mutt, all right? Toby's... Uh, how do they put it? Oh yeah, a bona fide detective. Sorry? I'm giving him a proper title and everything. Here's Chief Inspector Toby to you. More senior than Inspector Gregson, is he? Oh, so he's a police dog, is he? The police recruit dogs now? I've heard that they've already been being used officially in Germany as part of their city policing. They're used for chasing criminals and such like. They have a wonderful sense of smell after all. I have a fairly good sense of smell at myself as it happens. I can tell undergarments that have been freshly laundered from undergarments that haven't. I would hope anybody can do that. But okay. That's nothing compared to this little fellow, Odo. Oh, really? A coin. Oh my god, sorry. I, I. I thought I saw something crawling on my desk, and my eyes just went whoop! According to what the boss said, once Toby is a good. got a good whiff of your drowsers. Your drawers, your drawers, wow. He could chase that scent to the other side of the world. What? To the other side of the world? What? Uh, you mean... <laughs> he can swim? Mr. Naruto, I think you may have missed the point by rather a wide margin. I just can't believe this little dog is such an incredible skill. I'm telling you, Odo, there's going to be much... There's going to be more and more dogs doing their fair bit of police in the future. Yes, I agree. Right, one of these days, they'll be barking orders at us lot, not the other way around. Oh dear, sorry, Jean. I don't think I agree with your vision quite that much. Well, anyway, whatever you think about that, Toby here is Britain's police... First police dog. I found him down in the East End the other day. Someone had just chucked him out on the street. There you go. I knew she lifted it up from somewhere. Oh, Gina, you're such a kind-hearted soul, aren't you? The children and animals. Gina. Are they going to say anything new about this? The Crystal Tower. I can't believe I'm seeing it in such close proximity with my own eyes! You've really been looking forward to the Great Exhibition, haven't you, Mrs. Sato? Yes, when I found out that I had to return to Japan, I'm afraid I cursed my luck. Here you are, back in London, gazing up at the magnificent tower. I know, perhaps I was wrong to curse my luck so harshly. These stairs lead up to the experimentation stage. Let's go and see what we can find out. Oh my, so this is the machine. 
That was used to deceive people into thinking instantaneous kinesis had taken place. Yeah, that's right. Or rather, it was the machine. It's a little worse for wear at the moment. What extraordinary lengths Professor Harebrain went to in order to obtain the research grant. No, no, no! The professor was tricked as well! He didn't know anything about it. Oh, yes, of course. It is, it is amazing, though, isn't it? The scale of the whole affair is so very British. You're right about that. You'd never see such a grand deception in Japan, that's for sure. Oh, look, is that... Oh! Van Zeeks, hi! You know, I've really uh, grown accustomed to seeing him outside of the courtroom. I could, uh... I could get used to this whole seeing him outside the courtroom thing. More often. If this was, like, a regular occurrence, uh, I'd be down. I'd be down for that. Just saying. I think we're more or less done here, aren't we? Shall we, Mrs. Otto? Already? He is the Reaper, remember? We'll do well to keep our distance, I think. Oh no, we can close the distance, it's fine. But we have permission to be here from the top. We're perfectly well allowed to investigate this machine, as long as we don't touch anything. From the top? So, do you mean Lord Strongheart? Exactly. So we can stay here and stare at this wreckage for as long as we like. She could have been at the center of the explosion here, and it wouldn't have bent her steel will. Still, steel will. So, uh, Beric von Zeeks, hi. I'm gonna get right down to business. Hi, Beric von Zeeks. Least approachable man in the world. Winner ten years in a row. Be strong, Mr. Naruto. Your country and your assistants stand firm behind you. Lord Van Zeeks! Hello. <laughs> oh, this is great. What? Well... Beautiful weather we're having, isn't it? I thought that was making it quite clear that I didn't want to be disturbed. Apparently, you Nippanese are unequipped to read the signs. Oh, I read them! So, what are you doing here? Entry to this area is prohibited. Ah, well, the thing is, um... Lord Chief Justice Strongheart granted us permission to investigate. On the condition that we didn't disturb anything. And yet, you've managed to disturb me. <laughs> ah! Never mind. State your business, then. Come to think of it, uh, there are quite a few things I'd like to ask Lord Van Zeeks about. Not least of which is that awful case, even though it's nothing to do with this. Ask away, Mr. Naruto. You won't know unless you try. Ooh, do we really get personal? Is this really the time to get personal about his brother? Let's save that for last. Ugh. Are the police here trying to locate the engineer, Mr. Drebber, already? Surely that goes without saying. Uh, well, we're very keen to see him found as well. The trouble is, we don't have much to go on aside from the description of the man we heard in court earlier. Which, according to Professor Carebrain, was of a tall, thin gentleman who has straight white hair and wears a black monocle. So, I was just wondering... I mean, I realize it's probably not possible, but... Um... We'd very much appreciate any more clues that you can give us. Wow. Susato-san really knows how to take the bull by the horns. Fine. Why not? A photograph... I have a photograph of the man here from an investigation ten years ago. Hmm. 
Though it appears he had already had the black monocle at the time. Ten years ago, huh? What? No, nothing. I, um, I was just surprised that you shared that with us. We all need the man's testimony in court tomorrow. Which means we have to do everything we possibly can to track him down in the short time available. So why wouldn't I show you the photograph? What is it about Lord Van Zeeks? Sometimes I just can't work him out at all. That is why I like him so much. He's a confusing motherfucker. So, about your brother... So, Clint... Uh, was the name of your older brother, I understand, Lord Van Zeeks? You nipple knees, I always have to be on guard whenever you are around. So, you've been investigating me, have you? Uh, no, 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 it's not like that! <laughs> well, alright, it's a bit like that. Um, yeah. My older brother was also a prosecutor. He was the pride of the Van Zeeks family. But tragically, a vicious killer took him from us. The professor, you mean? <laughs> Is something funny? That's the extent of what you've discovered, is it? I shouldn't be surprised. There's more to it? Lackluster work is very much your trademark, isn't it? You're too kind. Uh, are you going to tar all Nipponese with the same brush next? So tell me, what's your interest in that historic incident? As it happens, Lord Van Zeeks, there's a rather curious case that's come to our attention. Are you aware of the Madame Tuspel's Museum of Waxwork by chance? I am, naturally. I believe that since last month I, fe I feature in one of the displays there for public scorn. Of course, the infamous Reaper of the Bailey would have to be exhibited, wouldn't he? Well, a particular waxwork has been stolen from the place and held for ransom. A particular waxwork, which, wait, you mean? Yeah, it's the professor. Mr. Sholmes is investigating the case as we speak. I was unaware of that. He's turned as white as a sheet. Hi. As the file I requested for the trial tomorrow. Thank you. Are you alright? Who is this man, Mr. Naruto? Lord Van Zeke's apprentice, apparently. I'm not the only one. Sasada-san can see it, too. Lord Van Zeeks. May we speak with your apprentice for a moment? With him, why? She said it. 
She said it. He responded. Kazuma. I don't believe it. Your posture, your presence. It can only be... It's you, isn't it, Kazuma-sama? I felt something strange the very first time I encountered this cloaked figure. As if I knew him somehow. Can it really be you, Kazuma? Whoa, 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 wait, wait! Too late. What's going on here? Your apprentice? What is your interest in my apprentice exactly? You act as if you know the man or something. Well, um... Since when has he been in your care? I don't recall you having an apprentice before I left Britain six months ago. Lord Strongheart introduced him to me about three months ago now. With instructions to mentor him as a prosecutor. But he didn't tell you why, did, did he? The man appears to be suffering from amnesia. He's forgotten every last detail about himself. He has amnesia? Tomorrow, he will appear in court on my side. What? He's to serve as my judicial assistant on Lord Strongheart's orders. He'll be in court with us. Now then, unless I'm much mistaken, I believe this conversation has run its course. Thank you. I definitely saw a reaction. When Sasaru-san called out like that, it seemed to hit a nerve. When she called out Kazuma-sama... Oh my god. What is your interest in my apprentice, exactly? Oh wait, shit. I didn't mean I... I, I didn't realize I hit the A button. I don't want to get my hopes up too high, but that was my theory, man. That was my theory as soon as I saw him for the first time. Fuck. I'm gonna present this to you for no fucking reason whatsoever. Oh wait, first let me look at the photograph. Ah, that matches his business card. Uh, what's that? It's just something I was hoping to ask your opinion about, that's all. <laughs> it's a serious crime for the defense to attempt to extract information from the prosecution by illegal means. Alright, I get the message, but I don't see what's illegal about me asking. <laughs> <sighs> I just wanted more excuse to talk to you, Van Zeeks, outside of the courtroom. It's been a pleasure. What a terrible explosion it must have been. Even the steel girders have buckled and twisted in the blast. And what they call the birdcage was right in the middle of it all, just here. But look, Mr. Narhudo, that metal grill on the floor. Looks as though it's designed to open. It does, doesn't it? If the floor had opened at the precise moment the explosion occurred, the birdcage could have dropped through and disappeared from sight. I don't think that there's any doubt that this was a very elaborate hoax, is there? This wasn't here yesterday. Really? Yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, I want to kill this piece of shit so bad. 
It's a cage in which the victim was standing before, uh, before he was apparently beamed through the air. That's right, the bird cage. According to what Professor Harebrain said in court, it's made of wood. Or more precisely, Japanese cypress, I think. And despite having been an explosion and then falling from a great height, it's relatively unharmed. <laughs> Mods, you're the best. I will kill you! Son of a bitch! Stop bugging me! What do you say, Mr. Naruto? I had understood that the forensic investigation team had taken it away yesterday to examine it. I suppose they must have brought it back here when they'd finished their work. But sadly, not with the body inside of it. No, that's right. I know we were given strict instructions not to touch anything, but still... This is too important a piece of evidence to overlook. We might need it for the trial. The birdcage from the machine has been entered into the court record. You've already met that masked man, hadn't you? Yes, uh, yesterday, in fact, at Lord Van Zeek's office. I see. And if, if Kazuma-sama really is still alive, it means that Mr. Sholmes lied to us. Ah! Did he, though? It's more like he just avoided the truth. He never outright said, if I recall, <laughs> that the victim was dead. You're going to have to leave now. Oh, the forensic investigation team are due to arrive shortly. If they find you here, it will cause problems. What sort of problems? Four in the fair problems. Well, we could do without that. Van Zeeks, you are so confusing. go to the forensics laboratory and then Madame Tuspel's last, because that's where Sholmes is. And we save the best for last in this house. What a place. Okay. I believe this is it, Dr. Sid's laboratory. That chemical smell really assaults the nose, and there's plenty to assault the eyes in here, too. It looks as though the doctor isn't here. But we're here now, so we may as well do some sightseeing, don't you think? What's a seasoned tourist you've be what a seasoned tourist you've become, Mrs. Otto? We could have just have a little look around, being careful not to upset any restless souls. Well, look at this! What a magnificent display case! The cherry wood has been polished to a high sheen and the intricate carving is a joy to behold! Western cabinet makers really are very skilled, aren't they? Do you have nothing to say about the skeleton inside, Mr. Naruto? Mrs. Otto? Can't you tell that I'm trying very hard to avoid talking about the terrifying contents of the case? It's how I cope. I'll be sure to remember that from now on. Yeah, thank you. Glad we got that covered. It looks like an owl and a crow up there. I know, and they haven't even twitched since we came in here. Well, no, they wouldn't have. They're taxidermy mounts, Mr. Naruhudo. Uh, I was afraid you were gonna say that. I've been trying very hard to tell myself that this is uh, that they're just sleeping with their eyes open. 
Uh, yes, I think perhaps you were wise to put something like your Dharma doll on display in the office instead. Hmm. I suppose this is Dr. Sid's desk. I would not like to work in a place like this. It's very tidy though, isn't it, Mr. Naruto? Imagine how efficiently she must work. The lighting is poor, which is bad for the eyes, and the chemical smell can't be good for you. Not to mention the skeleton watching over you as you work, which is definitely bad for the nerves. Well, yes, those are valid concerns, I suppose. I just can't about- I, I just can just about cope with one-eyed Dharma doll watching over me, but that's all. That's Ryanosuke's limit. Look at all the bottles on the shelves in those cabinets. What an assortment of chemicals. These ones here are labeled highly toxic. Ah, that's worrying because there are also things that look like salt and pepper shakers in there. Oh yes, and they actually do say salt and pepper on them. Oh my god. The doctor probably spends a lot of time in his room, I suppose. Perhaps she has, has meals here sometimes. Life goes on even when you're surrounded by death. A table and a set of sharp tools. When you consider each in isolation, it all looks quite innocent. So why is it that when you put them aside, they seem so horribly disturbing? It might be best not to ponder it too deeply. Seeing the large tome that's opened on the desk does make me wonder, though. How can anybody concentrate on bookwork when this acrid odor of chemicals in the air? You'd either have to ca have a cast iron constitution or a really terrible sense of smell. Those large jars seem to have pale things floating around inside them. I suppose they're fruit liquors or something, or like the pickled uh, yumebushi plums we'll make back home. We make back home. Ah, father has jars like that in his laboratory as well. I expect they're human organs in a preserving in a preserving solution, probably as examples of some rare medical condition. Mrs. Sato, there are some things in the world that it's perfectly fine never to know about, ever. Oh, so as I said, I'm sure they're fruit liquors or yumeboshi, aren't they? Oh, of course. That's right, bitch. Yeah, they are. Thank you. Glad we got that covered. Okay, well, there is uh, nothing else for me to look at and nobody that showed up. So, I am led to believe I need to go talk to Sholmes first. Game wants me to do this last. Oh my, no wonder it's called the House of Horrors. I'd like to turn on my heels and go straight home via the confectory. Being scared makes you crave sweets. I can understand that. I was looking forward to a reunion after six months away, but... There's no sign of Mr. Sholmes anywhere. That's strange. He should be here investigating the abduction of the waxwork. Oh well, I suppose we'll just, ha just have to come back again later. What? What do you mean? Oh yes, the heavy curtains in the middle of the house of horrors. Whatever on the- whatever's on the other side of them, you just know it's going to be terrifying, don't you? The sign says in the Madame Tuspel special exhibit. Seems you have to pay extra to go inside. I know, can you believe that? Pay more money as if we weren't- haven't been scared enough already? It's not my doing, Mr. Naruto. Yeah, well- <laughs> What a horrifying scene! A murder caught in the grisly act! I know, and in case you were wondering, it's the one with the big knife that's supposed to be the killer. I don't think anybody would be in any doubt about that, surely. And did you know that according to the description, the bathtub in the back has no particular significance? 
What really? I would have thought it was meant to show that the killer also worked in a bathhouse peddling criminal wares. What? We have a new theory. This one's posture reveals his weakness. Sorry? The killer's stance leaves him wide open to attack. I'm quite sure I could see him off. With a Susato takedown, then a Susato squash, and finally a Susato smash! Right, right, uh, uh, if that doesn't render the culprit unconscious, a Susato slam could finish him. A Susato slam. Oh, I'm sorry. It's rather hard to explain. Leave yourself open slightly, and I'll... I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Absolutely not. Oh, there's a stepladder there, look. Oh yes, a stepladder. I think perhaps we should let the propri propri proprietress know that someone's left it out. The stepladder, I mean. Is something wrong? Why do I feel as though I just managed to sidestep an argument? I don't get it. So I can't- oh, I can look at this guy. That old policeman isn't here now, obviously. I still can't believe he just happened to be on the jury, though. I'd understood that London has a population of six million people, and yet... You do seem to run into the same people disproportionately often, don't you? It's a running joke in the games whether or not stepladders are just ladders or... Okay, I, I didn't need to know. <laughs> There's nobody here either! Sholmes? This person? Um, anybody? Hi? I guess I'll go present more shit to Mr. Professor Friend. Hi, I'm back! I know you missed me a lot. So about this cage. Uh, nope, it's nothing. Uh, do you know the photo? Nope, okay. He's still freaking out. Okay, nope, that's a dead end. We're done with Mr. Prisoner. And we're done with the Lord Chief- yeah. Chief Justice Office is done. Okay. Great ex uh, experimentation stage. Uh, gonna backtrack here. Hi, Gina! Where's your dog? Oh! Wait, we already investigated the scene. Is this the same combo? Um, Gina, we were actually hoping that we can investigate the scene again. Yeah, alright. If it's around here, you can do what you like. This is the same. They're acting like this is a new conversation. The dog is so cute. Okay, worth it. We get to see the dog. Look at the floor because we technically didn't do that again here's a scorching on the ground that you mentioned yeah and that there's what's left of the green balloons envelope all clear evidence of the balloon that exploded on the day of the incident poor professor hairbrain i do feel sorry for him that his dreams have been shattered like this someone's well and truly burst his bubble as it were oh god that's a rianosuke ouch I'm a bad person. All right, Ryanosuke. Okay. 
whatever, like, it suits your fancy, bro. Good, good to know. Okay. Back we go! Maybe I did miss something in the forensics laboratory. I could have. Let me just see. Like, oh, okay. I was wondering about the book. Okay, so we can specifically hone in on that. Look at this big, thick book here. Oh, it appears to be an accounting ledger. It's a record of the forensic investigations team spending, I think. What is it? It's clear that the team purchases various equipment and supplies on a monthly basis, but, well, one entry seems rather strange. In what way? They're buying 500 scapples every month. Wait, scapples. Isn't there still a scapple in Sholmes' stomach? I wonder if he ever got that treated. 500? That must be work- they must be working really hard to dissect corpses. I don't know. Judicial autopsies are only carried out in certain special- certain special circumstances. And scapel blades can be sharpened, too. Ah, it does seem a bit strange. You're right. 500 scapels a month. What could they possibly be using all of them for? That's a lot. What are you doing? Uh... Hi! Sorry, we had something we wanted to ask you, but you weren't here, so... So you thought you'd snoop around. That's un that's acceptable to the you f people from the East, is it? Well, what do you want? Uh, Lord Strongheart told us, you see, that it was you who examined the victim's body. Uh, Mr. Asmund's body, I mean. So we came to ask you about your findings. And or, on Lord Strongheart's advice. Very well. If the Lord Chief Justice has given the cons his consent, I'll tell you. What our investigation revealed... But, what, when, when we're done, you must leave immediately. So, you want to know what the forensic investigation team determined from its examination of the scene? The victim, Mr. Odie Asman, has disappe who disappeared from the experimentation sta stage amid an explosion. And the Mr. Asman, who appeared moments later, partway up the Crystal Tower. Well, without question, one and the same person. That is the team's conclusion. That can't be right. If it was an elaborate trick, we can only speculate only how it, about how it was carried out. Let's see, if two people were looking- were, who looked very similar to each other were involved... They could have made it appear as if one single person had switched places, couldn't they? Very true, but sadly in this instance, that was not the case. The man who disappeared and the man who subsequently reappeared was the same person. The fingerprints at the scene match- make that quite evident. Ah, fingerprints. They're not yet officially recognized as forensic evidence in the British judicial system. But one day they will be used as an investigative aid as a matter, as a matter of course. Oh my, but that would mean that the instantaneous kinesis actually took place. No, it didn't. Where does that leave us? My team was tasked with investigating, not drawing conclusions. Instantaneous kinesis is impossible, and yet the body did move from one place to the other. This hasn't cleared anything up at all. It's made the whole thing even more of a mystery. Oh! Mama, what is this? Where did she spring from? Did she just call the doctor Mama? This is a lawyer, dear. Oh! 
Um, hello? To meet you. Uh, uh, pleased to meet you. Yes, I'm a defense lawyer. Rhea knows get- Mama! Yes? Can I cut this one up? What? I've never seen inside an Eastern person before. I want to know what it looks like. Of course you can't. It's a living- it's a live specimen, as you can very well see. I think, um, I just had a near-death experience. Oh dear, Mr. Naruto, you're as pale as a corpse. Then let's leave before I'm mistaken for one. Yep, to Madame Tuspel's Sholmes, are you here? Please. Please. Sholmes? Sholmes, where are you? Don't make me go back. Sholmes. Sholmes, please. So what are you doing at the moment, doctor? Keeping a close eye on things so no impertinent Easterners think that they can look around my office. Are there such impertinent Easterners around? How terrible! Yes, you. She doesn't mince her words, Miss Cesano. I think perhaps it's time we left. Okay. I'll leave now. Sholmes, are you like back at home? Why you gotta be a little bitch? Stop making me hunt you down! Are you at home? Jones! God damn it! You're a bitch! Is he in my attic? I really don't want to re-examine everything in my room. I'm good. Sholmes, I'm gonna fucking kill this man. You think the madam melted him? Probably. You know what? I can see it. I guess I'll just go everywhere. Uh, I don't think it's gonna do me any good. Uh, yeah, nope, not here. I would like to speak to Sholmes! I am going to murder this man myself. If the game won't do it, I'm gonna do it. I swear to God. Is it really like. Mm. He's probably hiding somewhere. Oh my God. He's supposed to be in this fucking room. I'll be. Uh, what? What? Be unsatisfied? No, I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna find Sholmes and kill him myself. When we find Sholmes, he's a dead man. One for not talking! Bruh. Boy just straight up isn't talking. And I'm very angry about it. Oh. Well, if 
find him someday? I know. Thank you guys for being patient. I appreciate it, chat. Uh. Maybe this isn't a bad idea. We do have Susato back. Maybe I should spend more time with Susato. Fine. I'll bite. I'll bite. You have water gently boiling on the stove, I see. Feels wrong somehow if I can't hear the water bubbling away. We have plenty of logs. It's not like we have to worry about paying for gas. It's important to open the window for fresh air when the fire is burning, though. You can't keep it closed just because it's cold outside. It could be a matter of life and death. Perhaps a nice cup of tea will warm you up later. Aw, thank you, Justin. I appreciate it. Oh. Uh, I know we got kicked out of here. Okay, no, it's just, it's like just this room. That's one thing I didn't pay attention to. Sholmes exists. He's a little bitch. Fucking hate him so much. It's official. It's official. I'm blind. That's just it. Sholmes? Maybe Sholmes was an illusion the whole time. Ah, <laughs> uh, no! In fact, Sholmes is the very heart of most of these cases and happenings. And it makes me very, very upset. I think about him way too much. It's probably really unhealthy. I did think for a moment that um, he was actually going to be in the bathtub. That would have been fucking hilarious if Sholmes was in the bathtub. I was, I, I keep scrolling over it, but there's a check mark, so. I keep thinking like, oh, maybe. I, this just could be one of those instances where I needed to trigger something else for something in here to happen. Cause yeah, Sholmes is supposed to be here. Not like the little hole. The amount to which I think about this man is so much, and it's so bad too. I hate it. Let's look at my Dharma doll. I see your Dharma still has only one eye filled in. Well, we agreed that it's something we'd do together, didn't we? We could do it right now if you like. I'd be happy with that. I'd rather like the anticipation, I think, Mr. Naruto. Okay. I tried. Whatever. <laughs> what? No, don't do this to me! Sholmes exists! I hate it. I hate you guys. Why you do this to me? <laughs> this spade's been here since we first moved in, hasn't it? I'm sure I told you before, Mr. Naruto, it's not a spade, it's a shovel! Shovels are for digging, and that's for scooping up loose material, it's a spade! No, spades are for digging, that's for scooping up loose material, it's a shovel! The great spade shovel war rages on. I wonder how long it'll go. Tune in next episode. Sholmes is real. <laughs> Don't say this to me, chat. Don't say this to me. Sholmes is a real boy. He's real. 
You really must tidy it all up, Mr. Naruto. No more excuses. Mrs. Sato, the way I see it, uh, all these papers building up on my desk like this are a reminder of my wonderfully diverse daily life. I like to bl I like to leave them as they are, so I never forget how how lucky I am to have such a varied experiences. What am I talking about? Oh my god, you guys hate me, I swear. I hate you guys. <laughs> Why? Jones is real. Your room there should be exactly as you left it. I've still never been inside. I've never been invited. Of course not. Only Iris is allowed in my room. No doubt I'll be hearing you two giggling away in there again then. Get me out of this room. Why do I feel like I need to go back to the experimentation stage? Did I examine everything down here? I could also present stuff to Gina. And there's nothing left to examine here, like not these people. Oh, okay, they are specifically letting me look at that. But we already did. What a shame that the symbolic landmark of the Great Exhibition has been damaged like that. Unfortunately, the birdcage crashed in the most prominent position possible. It's the gods giving us a warning if you ask me. Man must travel under his own steam and not cut corners with instantaneous kinesis. You think Sholmes is a plant? What the? Imagine what might happen if the birdcage had landed in a suddenly slightly different location. The death toll could have been far worse. So I think perhaps it was a blessing in disguise. Well, the gods are benevolent, obviously. I say it was just a warning. Man must travel under his own steam, or next time bird cages will rain down on all of you. Your faith is much stronger than I realized. How do you think I passed the entrance exam for Yume University? It wasn't by studying alone. I bet I can look at the beautiful flag here. Oh, I can look at the balloons. Oh look, a flying balloon! I've never seen one in the flesh before! Chat, what are you going on about? Oh my god, this is getting worse! I hate this! Yops is real! I can't understand how they can fly it's so high up as well. Oh, but think of the view, Mr. Naruto. You must be able to see for miles and miles. I do think of it and it terrifies me. I mean, it would be certain death if you fell out. I'm sure that they're perfectly safe after all. They've been invented by some of the brightest minds in the world. Let's not forget that we know at least one who exploded. At, at least one exploded. I'm sure, I'm sure there's other ways to fly. Susato! Wait, this is a check mark, this is not. Wait, what? The stage up there is where the experiment was set up. It's very high, isn't it? About 30 feet, I believe, or nine meters if you prefer. Training your neck to see up uh, to see up to it starts to hurt after a while, doesn't it? We need to get up there and look around properly. Although if I'm honest, climbing all those stairs makes my chest hurt. Oh dear, I think perhaps you should exercise more, Mr. Naruto. Okay. I'm just doing this as a just in case. I love Gina's smile. I just love that she's like even smiling at all now. It's so precious. About this, Gina. Yeah, I'm still learning me letters at the moment. I only know A and E, so if it's too much bleen trouble... Oh. Uh, actually, Gina, it's the back of the card that's important. Eh? How come? There's just a dirty old smudge on the back, that's all. Turns out that this is a very high-quality French machine oil. It has a very particular scent, apparently. 
You don't say. Let's have a whiff then. Uh, sweeter buddy, thank you so much for the Prime Gaming sub. I appreciate it. You sure? I don't smell nothing. No, no, we didn't mean that you should smell it. Oh, right. You mean Toby. Bring the doggo out. His sense of smell is so good he can track people over the oceans, can't he? Professor Hairbrain informs us that this oil is unique to Mr. Drebber's workshop. Uh-oh, dog's going to town. Dog's going to town. I think he's picked up the scent. So you mean if he follows the scent of this oil, Toby can lead us to that dodgy cove's workshop? That's right. That's exactly what we were hoping. All right, then. We'll give it a go. I'll just borrow that. Wait, what? when did you... Uh, once a pickpocket? <sighs> if I can lead everyone to that Drebber's workshop, I'll be the boss's boss before next week! Oh yes, Gina! I'm sure you'll be promoted. Poor, poor Gregson. Right then, Odo! Leave it to me! Sorry? We're gonna get after that dodgy, dodgy engineer cove right this minute! But hang on, something's supposed to be on guard duty here on the time. I'm afraid we can't help. We need to get on with our investigation as well, Gina. Oh, right. Oh, well, never mind. It ain't gonna be what gets me, gets it in the neck. It'll be the boss. Poor, poor Gregson. Again. Ready, Toby? Got that oil scent, have ya? Come on then, boy. See you later. I do hope the scent of that oil leads them, leads them to the swindler's workshop. I hope so too, ideally before the dog swims across the channel to France. Well, I think we've done all the investigating we can here for now. Or if we could just determine the whereabouts of Mr. Drebber. I'm sure Gina and little Toby won't let us down. Now then, do you think we ought to try to speak with Mr. Sholmes at this point? Yes! We have things to discuss and I'm dying to meet him again after all these months. Ah, yes, it's quite possible he might know something useful, you're right. We ought to find him at Miss T Madame Tuspel's. He's supposed to be working there as a temporary waxwork exhibit. Here we go. Yes, Iris told me all about his latest unusual venture. Finally. Let's go. Sholmes? I'm here. Here we go again at the House of Horrors. I'm afraid I haven't gotten used to the place yet. I'd still like to turn on my heels and go straight home via the confectionery, of course. So Sada-san really is after something sweet today, isn't she? What's the matter? Look, Mr. Naruto, look at that waxwork! I'm quite sure it wasn't there before. I'm just wondering what Sholmes is doing right now. Let's see it. Oh, it's the same position as... Okay, his normal one. I thought he was gonna have a different one. It looks exactly like Mr. Sholmes down to the, to the very last detail. Sorry, I think you'll find um, that's the temporary waxwork himself. Ah, the friend of my dedicated employee. Hello again, it's Rinosuke, Rinosuke Naruto. I must say I am quite spellbound by the great detective. He is a marvel. My precious waxwork is already back where it belongs. You don't mean... Oh, but yes, the mystery is solved already. Wow, Mr. Sholmes can really engage his brain when he's hungry enough. So, as you can see, he has returned to his habitual duties. Ah, yes. His habitual duties? Alors, do not disturb, huh? Of 
versus Sadasan, she looks very perplexed. We gotta try, we gotta try. Sholmes, Sholmes, Sholmes. We really do need to speak with Mr. Sholmes, and I'm longing to say hello again. But where is he? <sighs> I think you might find that he's quite nearby. What do you... Indeed, my dear fellows, it is I! The world-famous brain detective and waxwork, Herlock Sholmes. Susana-san! Oh my god, did she... She didn't. <gasps> did she Susana take down him? Or did she faint? It sounded like... Did she- wait, it sounded like she did a Sasato takedown on him. I can't tell. We're about to find out. My humble- most humble apologies. I thought I'd died and gone to Turtle Paradise for a moment. Oh my god! Oh my god! Via London! My dear madam, allow me to make amends by offering you a tasty free deduction at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so she fainted! <laughs> and he's offering a tasty free deduction. I can't. As long as it's not of a questionable street food quality. I don't understand. Why are you working as a waxwork here, Mr. Sholmes? Merely a, a secret identity, you understand? Though the case is largely solved now. Largely solved? We're talking about the waxwork abduction, I presume? Indeed we are, my good fellow. As I pred predicted, it was as easy as proverbial pie. Though I confess, I'm yet to partake of a pie. Proverbial or otherwise. Or, uh, or any food so far today, for that matter. <laughs> He's hopeless. <laughs> no! Ah, that, stumble, that stomach rumble echoed around the whole museum. Uh -huh. So, uh, how did you manage to solve it so quickly? Oh, well, uh, do remember I said it was largely solved. Anyway, I simply negotiated with the culprit. Are you familiar with the so-called telephone? Oh, yes, it's a most modern invention, allowing you to hold a conversation with people far away. In Japan, only the Imperial Capital and a handful of other cities are connected as yet. This morning, a telephone call was received here from the perpetrator of the abduction. As such, I was able to negotiate terms, and in the end, the waxwork was returned. That's amazing! Just between you and I, it would appear that the culprit has in had intended, always intended, to return the stolen waxwork in any event. But... I thought whoever was responsible had demanded a ransom, no? Ah, yes. I think perhaps the ransom demand was necessary to avoid unwanted suspicion regarding the true motive. But does that not mean your negotiating was entirely unnecessary? A fact that I must ask you to keep from Madame Tuspels at all costs. A hungry young Iris awaits my return to Baker Street, after all. Poor Iris. Oh, now then. Do I sense that you have some business with this great waxwork? Oh, I have so many fucking questions. But I'm sure the game will only let me ask, like, one. So many questions, Sholmes. Oh, we can ask about Cosma's death. Oh, that's juicy! We're in the process of trying to track somebody down. Oh. Yes, a man by the name of Enoch Dreber. He's the swindler who duped Professor Harebrain and the, the engineer who built the kinesis machine. 
a swindler and an engineer. Quite the modern man. He also seems to be a conjurer of some sorts, too, with considerable knowledge of stage magic. We really need to locate him before the trial resumes tomorrow morning. But we have so few clues to go on, that's the trouble. Do you have any good ideas? Huh, I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to have good ideas before one has data. If I knew something of the man's appearance, at least, it may, I may be in a better position to help. Ah, yes, Trevor's appearance. Fortunately for you, however, presentedly, I have little to occupy myself with and little f to fill my stomach. As soon as you find any clue, no matter how small, I shall gladly give you, give you my thoughts on it. Um, sure. Don't mind if I do. Hey, Sholmes. Did I ever show Sholmes my armband? I don't think I did. Hey, Sholmes, look at my armband. Mr. Sholmes, about this. As you will see, I'm rather busy at the moment. Oh my god. Shall we say, through pence per item as a consolation fee? He is so poor. <laughs> That's two hours of gas, that is! Oh my god. Mr. Sholmes, would you cast your eyes over this photographic print? It's of Mr. Enoch Drebber. The face of the engineer we seek. Well, all, eng all Englishmen look broadly the same, of course. So, looking at a photograph won't be particularly instructive. There he goes. Are you all right, Mr. Sholmes? Oh, uh, yes, forgive me. Very interesting, this. Very interesting indeed. What's wrong, Mr. Sholmes? You've turned quite pale all of a sudden. All right, the big question. Cosma's death. Why were you on the steamship the first time we met, huh? He's probably not gonna answer that. But why did you... Cosma's death. What happened? What happened? Mr. Sholmes, did you lie to us? My dear Mr. Naruto, stay that piercing stare. What is this about? Last winter, when we were first on our way to Britain aboard the steamship. I'm nervous. I'm so nervous. Your words were very clear. So then, let us unravel this mystery and discover what events led to this curious murder. You told us that it was murder. And you examined Kazumasuma's body. Indeed. And wherein lies the problem? We met him earlier today, the victim, Kazuma Asagi. You're quite sure. He was wearing some sort of mask and was apparently suffering from amnesia. But yes, I'm quite sure it was Kazuma-sama. You must have known at the time, Mr. Sholmes, that he wasn't actually dead. Well, I can only assume I was swept up in the murderous atmosphere of the moment. But the fellow wasn't dead at all. Ha <laughs> ha! Priceless! I don't suppose that performance would pass muster, would it, Mr. Naruto? No. I could believe that the crewman present at the time made a mistake. But not you, Mr. Sholmes. I will now tell you something of the first importance, my dear fellow. Great detectives, I won't to lie. It would serve you well to remember that. Yeah, I still believe you, actually. Please, Mr. Sholmes. 
Tomorrow in court, you will find yourself on the threshold of a very great mystery. For now, I'm afraid that is all I can say. I have a suggestion, Mr. Naruto. Will you indulge me? What is it? As I explained to you when you arrived, the missing waxwork has been returned. As I per and I personally reinstalled it in the exhibit from which it was taken behind those thick curtains. Oh yes, the professor's exhibit, isn't it? Would you like to see it for a mere five shillings? That's a special one-time only price, you understand? What? <laughs> The opportunity won't come again, I might add. Wouldn't you like to see the fruits of my labor? Well, we do have a rather pressing investigation to carry out. Perhaps we could postpone? Ah, the price is a very reasonable five shillings. I think you'll find it's well worth it. Are you being quite serious, Mr. Sholmes? <laughs> Surely you need only look at my expression to ascertain if this is seriousness or silliness. I can never tell with you, that's the point. <laughs> Very well, it couldn't hurt. Here's your five shillings. Gratefully received. So, the special exhibit awaits behind the curtain. I invite you to pursue it at your leisure. Dodging again. Dodging again. The money's been spent, so let's go and see the special exhibit. There is one bit of information that I think I found out that is important in that conversation, though, is that he genuinely had no awareness of the body still being okay. Like, he might have had a suspicion of Cosma not actually being dead. He might have suspected that, but never believed it. But he didn't, whenever I mentioned the hooded figure, he didn't seemingly know about it. He didn't know where the body ended up being. So that is something. We can ask Gina to retrieve it for us using her special skills. Oh my god, I'm literally going to kill this little thing. Pickpocketing police officers and diddling detectives. Is this what makes Britain great? Not to mention demigod prosecutors taking the law into their own hands or chip-loving professors. Or professors. Inspector Greg's it. <laughs> Inspector Gregson comes off rather well in that list, I think. Hmm. Oh, how lovely. Oh dear, I felt a shiver run down my spine as soon as I walked in here. Mrs. Otto, I say we turn on our heels and go straight home via a really big confectionery. We, we certainly can't do that. We've paid five shillings already. True. Actually, now I'm looking a little bit more closely. We've paid good money to see an exhibit that's clearly incomplete. The nerve of the great diddling detective is far more terrifying than anything else in this place! This must be what Mr. Sholmes meant when he said the case was largely solved. Be that as it may, Mr. Sholmes heavily implied that there would be a clue about the engineer in here, didn't he? But where? Since we've paid five shillings, let's do five shillings worth of investigations, shall we? We will get what we paid for. 
Is that fear or frustration that's making Susano-san's voice tremble? This part of the exhibit is getting- is just as disturbing as the rest. It looks so real. It seems to be a young man in a white overcoat. And he has a large shovel in his hand, too. Perhaps we should investigate a little bit more detail. What's this here? It would appear to be a lens in the middle, so I believe it's probably a camera. A camera, but it's so small. British technology is incredible, isn't it? I mean, what about Mr. Sholmes' skin prints? I think perhaps you should treat Mr. Sholmes' inventions as exceptions to the rule. But anyway, why would the man be in a graveyard at night with a camera? I wonder. Perhaps he was trying to capture the moment a dead body came back as a ghost on film. We'll just borrow this for a little while, I think. By looking at the photographic plate inside the camera, we can see what picture was taken. What's a photographic plate? It's a piece of glass coated in a special emulsion that reacts to the light coming in through the lens. If we open the cover at the back of the camera, we should find it. Let's have a look. You should see yourself, Sasato-san. Your eyes are shining. You really do like machinery, don't you? I'm still not used to this whole controls thing. What a large shovel. He's holding it rather ominously, isn't he? What on earth was the man doing with a shovel in a graveyard in the middle of the night? Um, Mrs. Otto, that's a spade, isn't it? No, it's a shovel. No, no, shovels are for digging. That's for scooping up loose material. It's a spade. We've been through this, Mr. Naruto. It's a shovel. No, no, no! Although we haven't considered trolls. Oh my god. We've allowed ourselves to be distracted, I feel. Perhaps we should concentrate on what the man was doing with the implement. So we're going to bury the hatchet? You're right. What was the man doing in the graveyard in the first place? That's the real question. That's quite a large lamp the man's carrying. Or is it a lantern? It's not unlike a Japanese Chojin paper lantern, it, is it? Lamp, lantern, Chojin... The point is, it, it casts very little light. To be walking alone in a graveyard at night with only this? Well, I certainly couldn't do it. I'm not sure I could visit a graveyard at all, even in broad daylight, to be honest. see his face very well, can you? Perhaps if I just... Oh, uh, do you think you should be manhandling the exhibits, Mr. Naruto? I'll put it back exactly where it was, don't worry. What? Ah! What on earth? How can... I don't believe it. A black monocle! Mr. Naruto, is, is it possible that this man is... It's Enoch Drebber. The color of his hair is different, but it's unmistakably him. Indeed it is. Yeah? Mr. Sholmes! This man is the subject of your present hunt, I believe. That's right. Just who is this man? Why is he here in this exhibit, and why do you know him? Wow, 
Why does the convict behind him have no head? The head was missing when the model was returned by the thief who stole it. What a surprise! So then the case isn't yet solved, is it? Did I not say so myself? Largely solved were my words, I believe. But I must locate the missing head to the sweet, as Madame, Madame would say. So, or I'll be in grave trouble. A very hungry iris still awaits my return to Baker Street, pre preferably with rations. Do you know, though, something about this room is strange. What do you mean? Well, the displays in the House of Horrors are supposed to depict real events, are they not? Indeed they are, Mr. Sato. Do go on. And, as terrifying as they are, the scenes in the other exhibits are believable. But this one... This surely couldn't ever really happen. Could it? I think it's time I educated you a little. A little? Bitch, you have a lot to educate me on. A little is a little bit of an understatement. I'm gonna murder you. Myself. About the nature of the incident involving the professor ten years ago. Oh, you're finally gonna talk about something? The resurrecting convict, the young witness. Okay. Maybe they depict it like this because they this is where the Reaper of the Bailey comes from. He returns from the grave. I believe I told you a little about the professor yesterday, did I not? He took the lives of five victims, every one being either a member of the aristocracy or royalty. All were attacked by an enormous hunting hound and had their throats ripped from their bodies. A hunting hound, you don't say. An enormous hound. How awful. After taking the life of his fifth victim, the killer was apprehended. It was a case of unprecedented magnitude in Britain. You understand accordingly. The professor was tried in a closed court. No members of the public were permitted. A closed court. So you mean that the professor's identity... As you've surmised, my dear fellow, his identity was never made public. Naturally, he was found guilty and was summarily sentenced to death by hanging. He was buried in a grave at Logate, Cem Logate Cemetery. Where he, where, which adjoined the rear of the prison where he had been held. However, that was not the end of the affair. The very night that he was buried, the convicted man came back to life. He clawed his way out of the ground and emerged into the moonlit graveyard. The exhibit here depicts that very scene as described by the sole witness to those chilling events. There was a witness? Oh, but of course, my dear fellow. It was none other than the young man in the white overcoat. Enoch Drabber, he saw it happen. So this is a waxwork model of Enoch Drepper. Ten years ago, the convicted professor, having been gibbeted and buried, emerged from his grave in the dead of night. The sole witness to that unimaginable scene was this young man. From appearances, I would say that he was about 20 years old. It's so horrifying. Scared out of his wits, the young Drepper ran to a nearby police station to report the incident and the sheer terror of what he'd said he'd seen is said to have turned his hair white overnight. Yes, as shown in the photograph we have of him, his hair is completely white. For the following few days, the story of what he'd seen was on every front page in the capital. 
The public was frantic with for every last detail about the about the killer who'd come back to life. As you've seen, an exhibit was even created here at Madame Tuspel's. <coughs> I can quite understand why the man's hair turned white, certainly, but what I don't understand is what Mr. Drubber was doing in the first place in a lonely graveyard in the middle of the night. What was he up to? I really have to pee, I'm so sorry. I'll be right back. Okay, holy crap, I feel so much better. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm drinking so much water to try to save my voice. Oh. Okay. Following the execution. What the heck? Hold on. Hello? Oh god, my whole computer just froze. That was strange. Okay. Okay. I'm so good. I'm so good. That was just really weird. Okay. We're good. Um the professor acts of t uh, acts of terror threw London's upper classes into complete panic 10 years ago. It was a great scandal, one might say, at the very highest levels of society. And since the killer's identity was never made public, rumors abounded. After all, no killer had been had ever before systematically employed a dog as a murder as a weapon of murder. Yeah, I can imagine the impact the case must have had. But in time, of course, the rumors abated. So too did talk of the shocking witness account of the convict who came back from back to life. It was forgotten, dismissed as a dubious ghost story, as a preposterous parlor tale, parlor tale. Why did people stop believing it? Why? Simply because there was no resurrection to speak of, as was established in fact. What do you mean by no resurrection? The police investigated the grave in Logan Cemetery and published their, published their findings. The convict's body was found to be buried exactly where it had be, been following the execution. But that would mean Mr. Drabber must have lied to the police and the newspapers. 
That would appear to be only logical the only logical explanation. Yes. The young man subsequently vanished from society and nothing has been heard of him since. It's rather striking then that he should resurface now, don't you think? Of course, the convicted murderer couldn't really have come back to life. That's not possible. But Drubber's hair is unusually white, and if that really did happen overnight as a result of shock, it's hard to believe that the incident was an out-and-out -out lie. Hmm. Oh, wow. That's blood. What a wonderful machine. You really love contraptions like this, don't you? Oh, yes, anything mechanical I find absolutely irresistible. Almost irresistible, surely. Well, whenever I see a pocket watch, for example, I can't help myself. I simply have to take it apart. That's worrying. Yes, Father tells the time by the rumblings of his stomach now. He's given up having a watch. Poor Professor Mikatoba. Look, Mr. Naruto. On the bellows just here, there seems to be some very dark red stains. Ah, you're right. It looks like blood, actually. Oh my. I'm sure it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> uh. Oh look, the cover came open. Yes, now, there should be a glass plate inside. You have to change the plate with each new photograph you want to take, you see. Is something wrong? There's no plate. It's been removed. Ah, uh, what a pity. But I suppose if you want to think about it, this wouldn't be the actual camera that was used at the time, just like the waxwork isn't the actual person. So we'd never have found a photographic print of the ex executed convict coming back to life anyway. Oh, yes, you're quite right, of course. Poor Sasada-san, she looks devastated. This ain't real, but wait, if this ain't real, why is there real blood on it? Where's your logic? They wouldn't just, like, put blood on it. If you so claim that this is not real. Look here, Mrs. Sato. Ah, uh, yes, the wood's cracked and broken a little, I suppose because it fell from such a height? From a height at which the balloon was flying down into the crystal tower below, a fall about 30 feet, or 9 meters. Leaving the man inside tragically dead. Is that all there is to see on this? So we just took the whole birdcage as evidence? This whole birdcage. Anything else, Sholmes? Can I show you something stupid just to hear you talk more? So what about this camera? Ugh. Fucking piece of shit. This must be the killer! The fiend knows it, known as the professor! I think so, according to what Madame Tuspell said. He killed five victims, all of noble or royal blood. The waxwork is so lifelike, isn't it? Like all the models in this place. I know, it looks like it could start moving at any moment, doesn't it? If only it had a head, that is. Perhaps we should examine it in a little bit more detail. I really don't wanna. Can we just not? So this is the condemned man. Yeah, the so-called professor. Then, then, perhaps... 
his head was chopped off by a guillotine. But unable to find peace, he emerged from his grave as a headless ghost. Do we have to entertain such terrifying ideas, Mrs. Otto? Anyway, I'm sure the model had a head once. There's a, there's a metal fitting for it, see? Uh, then perhaps Mr. Sholmes absentmindedly forgot to reattach it? That's an extremely absent-minded detective you're describing, isn't it? Or perhaps the thief absent-mindedly forgot to include the head when he or she returned it to the museum? And that would be an extremely absent-minded thief. Could there have been some reason why only the head wasn't returned? Well, whatever the reason, it means that we don't know what the face of the infamous professor looks like, do we? There's something caught just inside the convict's jacket here. Looks like a piece of broken glass. It's very thick, isn't it? About five times thicker than normal window glazing, huh? So this body was returned to the exhibit this morning, huh? I suppose it must have been thick to increase its strength, but why? Well, perhaps because the glass had to span a particularly wide area, such as a, in a big building. We've seen a large glass building recently, haven't we? And some of the glass was broken, too. You don't mean exactly the Crystal Tower at the Great Exhibition. But why would glass from the Crystal Tower be lodged inside this waxworks jacket? Makes you think, doesn't it? That's quite the bit of evidence. Earlier in court, we established that the Kinesis experiment was a trick. And now, we discover this fragment of glass here, in this waxwork. Is it just a coincidence? Gina, why are you here? What the bleeding Nora Odo? What have you gone and done? Gina, what are you doing here? I I asked Iris and she said that this is where you'd be, so. So? Gina, not so loud in the museum. Madame Tuspells will have a have you take a position as a waxwork if you're not careful. I think there might be a bit there might be a bit more pressing concern. I still had some flash powder left from six months ago, so... So? All right, Gina, we understand. P please, put the down the gun! Sorry, I, I got scared. You should try being the one on the other end of that barrel. So, what brings you here, Gina? What brings me here? What do you think? We found it! We found that Dodgy Cove's workshop! You found Drever's workshop? Yup! Toby's nose took me straight there! The boss and the others are heading over there now in a drag, so come on! Here's the address, I got the boss to write it out. Thank you, Gina. We'll make our way there at once. Alright then, see you there! But Sholmes... Oh, are you okay? You go. Don't mind me. I'll just stay here, being still. What? I know my place in the exhibit over there. Oh dear, someone is feeling sorry for himself. Let's go, Mr. Sholmes, you're coming! Your words hearten me, I must say. But if I were to shirk my duties here, Madam would have me pay monetary recompense in Iris's dinner. Forget that! I'll pay for everything! Then there's 
is not a moment to lose, my dear fellow. I shall hail a carriage at once. Ugh. No offer to share the cost for Mr. Sholmes, then. I shall gladly pay half, Mr. Naruhodo. Thank you, Miss Sasato. Right, let's go. Okay. Enoch Drebber's Workshop. Oh. Why are there arrows? It's another... Oh, you can't see the arrows. Ah! It's under my camera! Arrows! Underneath of me! Huh. I see. I wonder what they're used for. It's another super high voltage instantaneous kinesis machine. Indeed, it would appear so. Though only a prototype, naturally. So you got here, then? Gina, well done for finding this place. In such little time, you've really worked miracles. It's Jovier is the miracle worker. Gregson. What? Are you okay? <laughs> Gregson continues to make me hungry. I thought you would lot would show up before long. Inspector, that's one knitted brow he got. He looks like he's eating a lemon, not a bag of fish and chips. Inspector, is there any sign of an of the engineer? Sadly not. We didn't find a soul in here. What a shame. Well, thank you for letting us know about this place and giving us the chance to investigate. According to what Gina tells me, we only found it thanks to a clue that you lot turned up. I wouldn't want to say to go to Paris with a debt of gratitude unpaid, now would I? Thank you. Anyway, if you're hoping to soup around in here, I'd get cracking. Lord Van Zeeks and the Forensic Investigation Team are on their way as we speak. Them again. I imagine you've got the picture by now. They don't take too kindly to lawyer types. Right. So then, my dear fellow, let's turn this place upside down once we have the chance. And you, Mr. Sholmes. Oh. <laughs> Sholmes! You officially killed my Joy-Con! This man officially killed my Joy-Con. What a fucking bitch. That was too perfectly timed. Pardon. They take even less kindly to great detectives than they do to lawyers. <laughs> very droll, Gregson, very droll. But you may consider me nothing more than an incons inconspicuous waxwork model. Right, uh, let's see what we can find in here. Ah, this appears to be most interesting. Yes, most interesting indeed, wouldn't you say? It's an impressive looking back massager, that's for what? I've no doubt that if you hit your shoulders a few times with that, your aches and pains would go- What? It's a royal society trophy for excellence in science. A young scientist could wish for no higher honor. Where Rianosuke? I don't- Not gonna question him. Would you like a massage? Um... <clears throat> um... Yes. No, no, I'm fine, thank you. I had no idea it was such a grand thing. I think it's becoming increasingly clear that there's much more to this Mr. Enoch Drebber than conjuring tricks. I couldn't agree more, my dear madam. So, what about you, Mr. Naruhudo? Wouldn't you like to take it with you? 
Or your tired shoulders, of course. Oh, yeah. He's not gonna let this go, is he? I'm curious, though. It's curious, though, isn't it? You would expect such an important trophy to be proudly dis uh, to be proudly on display somewhere. Not haphazardly cast aside. English gentlemen can be quite a mystery at times. What on earth is this? An aeroplane, Mr. Naruhudo. One day, scientists believe it will allow humans to fly freely in the skies. Is that how the trick will be described, is it? Sorry? It's actually suspended by a thin but very strong cable, isn't it? Oh, well, this model is, yes, but a real aeroplane would actually fly in high in the sky. Well, suspended from somewhere even higher in the sky, of course. Because large metal objects obviously can't really stay in mid-air unsupported. So do you... the solution is ever-taller towers? Yes. I want to know about these arrows. This is... it's a European-style quiver of arrows with steel bolts inside. <laughs> Do you suppose? Crossbow bolts, these. And just the right size for the bow that you, you lot turned up at the exhibition grounds. In other words. Yup. That's more evidence to support your theory. It all goes to show that Drebel was the one pulling the strings behind the scenes of the whole scam. Hmm. The back door. I want to go there. This door doesn't want to open. Yeah, looks like it got a pretty hefty lock on it. There's a specialist locksmith on his way over from the yard, so hands off until he gets here. With permission, Inspector. I could have that lock open in less than a minute. Well, you don't have permission. And no one's given it to you. Ouch. Gregson looks as though he really enjoyed that. He had a good time doing that. There's no sound of anybody on the other side. No, Trevor must have fled at the first sign of danger. Cause he, you know what he is? He's a little, he's a, a little wussy also, hold on. I know I can look up. I don't want to look up yet. I'm sorry, Mr. Narhudo. That machine is covered by the... Whatever, the act. There would be serious repercussions if you were to examine it from the Crown and the government. Oh my god, Sholmes. And Gina. Well, those two don't seem to be holding back. It's quite hollow inside. No working parts or devices of deception to be seen, my dear fellow. No loose chain dropped on the floor, nothing. Not even a bone for Toby here, my dear fella. British people are very ruled, are very much ruled by their own ideals, aren't they? I think that's just these two, Mrs. Otto. Oh. Oh. Is something wrong, Mr. Sato? I thought I heard a noise from the far side of that door. Well, Gina, did you hear it too? Uh, yeah, I heard it all. What do you reckon, Toby? Oh. Right, mind the grease! Whoever's in there, open up! This is Scotland Yard!
They're running. They're running. Someone is in there! This rotten bling look! My dear Gregson, as I said only minutes ago, if only it were countenanced, I could unlock the door in less than a minute. The perp- the person's getting away! Fine, I'll take the rat for it. Just get us through that blasted door. There, you may enter at will. You've confused minutes with seconds, I think. Sholmes. Time is of the essence, I feel. What are we waiting for? I'm in shock. Nothing for it, I suppose. It's an emergency. There's a strong possibility that beyond that door is the engineer that you all seek. Be prepared for action, my dear fellow. Oh my god. I don't like the sound of that. The last time we chased somebody and like went to a crime scene that was like, you know, active, um, uh, Sholmes got shot. And I didn't like that. I'm scared. Dynamite. Wait. Oh my god. Oh my god. Ah! What happened here? Why is everything go upside down? Rats. There's ain't, there ain't no one in, in there after all. Okay, but there's like a big thing of dynamite in the middle. It's a bomb. It's a bomb. Oh my god. Maybe that was the sound of drummer running away. Oh my god. If there's only one door open in this room. And no windows that could afford an escape route. Those skylights are too high. But there's footprints. Wait, what? Ow. What's happening? What's that? What's that? What's up there? Are those footprints on the ceiling? Um, blow me. What have we here then? Don't say blow me. Are we just ignoring the bomb in the middle of the fucking ground? Looks like that someone was trying to burn something in a hurry. That looks like a set of blueprints. To what? To that Professor Hairbrain's bomby machine, is it? Blimey, if we had these, there'd been no need to muck about trying to investigate all the scrap metal. There's something of great interest here, too. This rope was lying on the floor at the foot of the pillar. A rope? What's significant about that? Well, he climbed out. Never mind. You see, but you do not observe, Mr. Norhudo. I'm observing! We must investigate the entire room thoroughly and before the forensic investigation team arrive too. There's a bomb! Shams! He's literally, he's staring at it. He's just staring at the bomb. Do something about it, you idiot. Mr. Shams, have you found something? Huh, Mr. Naruto, yes, in point of fact, something rather fascinating. What do you make of this? Ah, uh, it doesn't look good. Um, I've never seen anything like it before. It looks like a bundle of thick cigars wrapped around in a large wall. Ah! Uh, Mrs. Otto, what's the matter? That, 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 that's a, surely that's a time bomb, isn't it? Did you say? A time bomb? Uh, sorry, but uh, what is a time bomb exactly? Why is Sholmes laughing? You truly are one of a kind, Mr. Naruto. Why are you laughing? I won't take that as a compliment. You don't know nothing, do you, Odo? You haven't got a clue what it is either, have you, Gina? I invite you to consult a dictionary later, Mr. Naruto. Okay, I invite you to take care of it. But this particular specimen is no time bomb, though I confess it has a very similar appearance. Okay, then what is it? I'm panicking. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. But then, what is it? I see. So that's it. Goodness, Mr. Sholmes. Have you seen to the heart of the matter? There are times when I consider my lot most unfair. For I'm fated never to know how it feels to flounder as you do when a puzzle presents itself. But I have learned to accept the hardships that come with being a great detective, Mrs. Otto. Here we go! I feel a great deduction coming along! 
Once again, I can draw two conclusions from this scene we see before us. The first, I'm, I'm standing for this, is that the inverted nature of the furniture in this room is the work of Drebber himself. But how could you... And the second conclusion is that the small device on the floor there is without question completely genuine. Please, Mr. Sholmes, you must explain everything. It would be my pleasure. After all, it is great detective's civic duty to teach Scotland Yard the finer points of the trade. Oh my god, look at his face! Oh my god, Gregson is so fed up. Inspector Gregson seems delighted with the idea anyway. <laughs> oh, you deflected the inspector's glare with such fortitude, Mr. Sholmes. Well done. You're too kind, my dear madam. I hereby dedicate this great deduction to you. Kindly stay and stand just there, Mrs. Otto. Oh, yes, I'd be delighted. So, shall we begin? Once again, Herlock Sholmes is proud to present his logic and reasoning spectacular. Here, I will put on my hat for this. Let's go. Wait. The Great Deduction! Topic 1. Flipped Furniture. It's plain to see that this room is in complete disarray. The bed, the table, the chairs, the lamp, everything is upside down. Almost as if every item in the room had until recently been happily positioned on the ceiling, before falling straight down onto the floor. Every item, every item in the room was on the ceiling? Are, are you suggesting that... Oh, nice. That's... Indeed, the key is here. Is gravity. It would appear that technology has at last succeeded in freeing us from the great pool of the Earth. For the gravity in this room was reversed and then suddenly restored to normality. The inverted furniture clearly reveals the truth about the part gravity played in this whole business. I quite understand your skepticism, Mrs. Otto. I too was incredulous at first. However, my conviction is my in my analysis was cemented when I observed this. An anti-gravity device. Almost identical to one that featured in a dream of mine only the other day, in fact. But then why does it have a clock on it? A most relevant question indeed. That is a timing device that controls when the gravity direction will switch. There were clearly there was clearly a rec requirement for the engineer to be able to restore normal gravity automatically. And fuck. And the commotion we heard earlier was from the other side of the door was the moment that restoration occurred. Yes, the reason why everything in here has been turned upside down is because of the anti-gravity device. Okay. So you see, we need look no further to explain the state of which we now find this room. The direction in which gravity acts in here was reversed by Mr. Drebber. Before being restored to normality in an automatic fashion sometime later by the timer device. I've witnessed precisely this scene in a dream I once had when I fell out of bed. Good. Conclusion! Because gravity was reversed. Ah, yes. Okay. Topic 
two, the missing engineer. Oh. My left Joy-Con, I found out, is the thing that has connection issues, because whenever I was using the other left one, it, uh, it, I didn't have any problems, so it's just this guy. Now, let us consider the next conundrum. What was our engineer friend's aim? Indubitably, the greatest clue we have to explain his actions is above our heads. Yes, how is it possible that there are footprints all the way up there on the ceiling? A question whose answer will lead us neatly to the truth, my dear madam. The reason there are footprints on the ceiling is because of the nearby skylight. Jihan Sada, thank you so much for the Prime Gaming Sub. I appreciate the support. Of course, Drebber's aim was singular, to escape. However, there is but one way into this room, excepting the skylight, that is. Ah. Oh god! By inverting the gravity in here, Drebber was able to fall conveniently to the ceiling. And make his escape via the otherwise inaccessible skylight, leaving those footprints behind on the way. But the ceiling in here is very high, Mr. Sholmes. If the gravity reversal was sudden, wouldn't Mr. Drebber have fallen up to the ceiling rather violently? Hmm, falling up is both scientifically and philosophically a rather interesting concept, I feel. But the man was cornered with nowhere to run, so escape through the skylight was his only option. You may recall that I found this in the room earlier, which I believe offers a solution. Oh, the rope. To reach the intended destination, what better tool than this rope? By anchoring one end to the wall, the man was able to lower himself to safely to the ceiling. Which explains how Drebber was able to escape this room before our arrival. He reversed the pool of gravity and fell via the skylight. And personally, I should very much like to reverse the pool of gravity again now, just for fun. Okay. Conclusion. Escape, escaped via the skylight. Ah, uh, okay. Thus concludes Herlock Sholm's great deduction of this topsy-turvy puzzle. I think this deserves an applause. Odd. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I believe it. Um, Gregson is even speechless. Yes. Gina's even speechless. Sasato's even speechless. She's completely spellbound. Mr. Sholmes, um, there is just a, a one thing that troubles me. I would expect nothing less. You're destined to be troubled by just one thing for the rest of your life. Uh, yes. The thing is, in is such a thing actually possible? Um, uh, an anti-gravity device, I mean? I would say that with man's current scientific knowledge at the turn of the 20th century. It's no more possible than instantaneous kinesis! <laughs> okay, I'm glad, I'm glad we got that covered. <sighs> oh, I'm, uh, that was bad. Okay. I'm glad that we straightened that out. But your whole deduction hinges on it. Ah, but my dear fellow, when you have eliminated, eliminated the impossible, whatever remains must be the truth. However improbable it may seem. Uh, 
It's a marvelous line, wouldn't you agree? One of my more enduring pearls of wisdom. I had Iris come up with it, the exact phrasing. My original was, uh, clumsy. Yes, I have a feeling I've read it in something that Mrs. Sato let me once. Objection. Oh, actually, there is one thing, Miss other, one other thing, Mr. Sholmes. Ah, the spell's broken at last. The rope you found was on the floor, wasn't it? Indeed it was! In lonely coils near the wall. But if Mr. Drubber had used it to escape in the way that you described, wouldn't it still be tied to the wall? Mysteries inevitably unravel in the end, as I think you'll find do ropes. And as evidence of such, you need only look at the mystery we face in this room now skillfully unraveled. That argument is as circular as the coils of rope. I think perhaps we might need to give Mr. Sholmes the usual little helping hand. I'm sure with some minor corrections, the great detective's great deduction will lead us to the truth. Ah, yes, you're right. And we must do it quickly before Enoch Drebber gets too far away. Oh, he's like gone to Egypt by now. Like he's, he's gone. If you're ready, then let us resume. Herlock Sholmes's logic and reasoning spectacular. Oh boy. It's plain to see that this room is in complete disarray. The bed, the table, the chairs, the lamp, everything is upside down. Almost as if every item in the room had, until recently, been happily positioned on the ceiling, before falling straight down onto the floor. Every item in the room was on the ceiling. Are you, oh, sorry, Sasato. Are you suggesting that... Indeed, the key here... This is a really cool effect. Is gravity. It would appear that technology has at last succeeded in freeing us from the great pool of the Earth. <laughs> the gravity in this room was reversed and then suddenly restored to normality. I'm more interested in the safe combination on the bottom of the chair. Why would you put a safe combination written on the bottom of a chair? Like, who the fuck does that? The inverted furniture clearly reveals the truth about the part gravity played in the whole business. To think gravity could have been reversed in this very room, I find the whole idea utterly enthralling. Only Mr. Sholmes could conceive of such an explanation. But the man himself admitted it was a scientific impossibility, so... Yes, you're quite right. We must completely discount the idea at once. That's unusually merciless of you, Mrs. Otto. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains must be the truth. The great detective himself said so, didn't he? While refusing to part with his dreams of anti-gravity devices. Yes, I suppose so. Well, let's see if examining this topsy-turvy scene a little more closely reveals some proof that shows exactly what the gravity in this room was or wasn't doing. Ah, look, Mrs. Sato. When everything seems to be upside down in here, this safe is conspicuously the right way up. It's also, like, super bolted into the floor, though. To be fair. But look more closely at the safe's feet. Oh, now they point it out. Ah, that's a lot of very large bolts fixing it to the floor. Think before you speak. That's what you wanted to say, isn't it? I really put my foot in my mouth there. I certainly didn't say that. Look at all of this shit, oh my god. Why? So much shit. Okay. Take that! 
Yeah, no. That didn't seem like it was right. I couldn't look for anything else, though. But this will be interesting. Unlike every other piece of furniture in this room, the safe is not upside down. So a reversal in gravity can't be the reason for the state of this room. Mr. Naruto, I implore you to observe more closely. As you can see, the safe's feet is firmly bolted to the floor, saving it from any effects of gravity. Ah, so it is. Ah, but there is one thing we can learn from your misguided conclusion. A great deduction is no mean feat. Can we at least make jokes at my expense funny? Agreed. Agreed. Perhaps we can prove it didn't occur. Ah, well, to prove his hypothesis wrong, the easiest way is to just find an obvious exception. Let's have another good look around. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. The flower pot. Well, well, I wasn't expecting to find a pretty bunch of flowers in here, that's for sure. Look at that. I know, that slender little vase lo looks like it's about to topple at any moment, but the flowers are thriving. Somehow it makes you think of the fragility of life, wouldn't you say? To be honest, Mr. Naruto, something else about it makes a, made a rather deep impression on me. Oh, yeah? Take that! The upright vase clearly reveals the truth about the part gravity played in this whole business. Upon my word, Mr. Naruto, you surpassed yourself by completely turning my argument on its head. Trying to impress your assistant here, perhaps? Uh, no one is trying to steal your spotlight here, Mr. Sholmes, trust me. As you rightly say, though it appears at first glance that all the furniture in the room is upside down. This unassuming slender vase is standing keenly to attention. And unlike the large save, there is nothing affixing it to the floor. And it's the exception that breaks the rule. In short, much as it pains me... Gravity in this room was never inverted at all! My, my deepest sympathies for your loss! <laughs> Oh, poor Mr. Sholmes. Oh, he's back. Ah, oh, but the show must go on, so let us continue with our deductions. Now that we know that this contrivance is not, in fact, an anti-gravity device, uh, there remains but one other possibility. You don't say. Someone deliberately turned over every piece of furniture in here. Which might sound obvious, but leaves one mystery very much unsolved. Uh, namely, why would anyone choose to do that? Ah, uh, quite naturally, there is only... There is an explanation. Ah, uh, yes, the reason why everything in here has been turned upside down is because of the anti-gravity device. He's absolutely determined that this device must have something to do with it. I'm afraid the lure of an exciting scientific explanation is too strong. Oh, well, there's no doubt that somebody did this. Somebody turned all this furniture over, so whoever did it must have had a reason. I'm afraid nothing comes to mind at all, though. Oh, let's look around. Oh, come on. We already know the answer. Where is it at? There it is. There's something written on the underside of this armchair. Oh, yes. Safe. Numbers. Safe and secure? As in a securable, secure lockable box, I think. Admittedly, more likely. Well, there is a large safe bolted to the floor on the other side of the room, so yes. So you mean this number would let us open it? I wonder why it's written here, though. Yeah, me too. Take that! Yes, the reason why everything in here has been turned upside down is because of the safe combination. Precisely. I believe, Mr. Naruto, that you had a very similar experience once, did you not? Oh. 
Ah, uh, yes, last year when I bought a lottery ticket and noted the ticket number down on the inside cover of a book just in case. That's it! For people who forgetful souls at heart and always make a written note of important information. Just keeping the ticket itself uh, safe would be more sensible, I think. And what, pray, happened next, Mr. Naruto? When the day of the, of the draw came around, I'd forgotten which book I'd written the number in and had to turn my room upside down to find it. That's it for people of forgetful souls at heart and always forget where they've noted things down. Not if you always note things in the same place. What is happening? This is by far the most ridiculous deduction ever. What the fuck? <laughs> I actually won the second prize, you know. I couldn't remember which magazine I'd slipped the thing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Narhodo, but I believe I've proved my point. We're just at a very similar scenario has clearly unfolded in this room. Finding himself requiring access to the safe, the occupant of this room needed the combination code. Oh, he remembered that he'd written it on the underside of a piece of furniture, but forgot which one. Leading to the estate in which we fi now find the room. Oh. Yes, Mr. Drepper overturned all the furniture in here. In a desperate hurry to locate the combination code that would unlock the safe. Ah. To find the safe combination. Right. Missing engineer. Okay, here we go. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Now, let us consider the next conundrum. What 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 was our engineer friend's aim? Indubitably, the greatest clue we have to explain his actions is above our heads. Ah uh, yes, how is it possible that there are footprints all the way up there on the ceiling? A question whose answer will lead us neatly, neatly to the truth, my dear madam. The reason there are footprints on the ceiling is because of the nearby skylight. Well, if a change in the direction of gravity can't explain it, then how do those footprints get there? Uh, yes, I feel as though that particular mystery has yet just become even harder to solve. I just can't think of any other way to explain it all. Life was so much simpler in those halcyon days when gravity could be reversed. It was minutes ago and those halcyon days never existed in the first place. Well, I suppose we must, we must simply put our faith in Mr. Sholmes and observe the area in more detail. Putting our faith in Mr. Sholmes is what gets us into these situations in the first place. This is a gas balloon, isn't it? It's tiny, but it does seem to be a real balloon. I think you're right. I think it's helium that's keeping it up. A green gas balloon. Why does that seem to ring a bell? If you can see, there are footprints on this balloon too. Oh yeah, surely that's a clue, isn't it? Though what it tells us, I'm not sure. There's also a shoe. It's hard to believe, uh, but there's a shoe. Oh yes, there are more footprints on this on this little balloon too. Perhaps the shoe was thrown up there and became lodged, do you think? If so, then judging from the number of footprints, it must have been thrown up several times. Why would anyone be throwing up shoes at the ceiling though? Oh dear, that's beyond me, I'm afraid. Oh, low battery. The reason that there are footprints on the ceiling is because of the nearby shoe. And on closer inspection, there are clearly footprints all over the balloon as well. In other words, the aim was never to the skylight at all, but the balloon. 
But for what purpose? A green balloon. Hmm, that seems somewhat familiar data. It was a piece of a green balloon's envelope that Mr. Naruto and I was found at the scene. And inside the green balloon that Mr. Gott claims that he saw above the stage when the incident occurred was the second bird cage, the crux of the whole instantaneous kinesis deception. You mean to say, if we assume that the balloon in here is a model of the one used on the day, there is a strong possibility that something may be concealed inside of it. Something our absconda was desperate to retrieve before making a hasty getaway. But the balloon's out of reach. Hence why we resorted to a projectile, namely the shoe. Most probably, Drebber intended to tear a hole in the envelope by assailing it with the shoe. However, his efforts were thwarted when the shoe itself became a prisoner of those lofty heights. Oh dear, we desperately need to examine that balloon. If only there was some way that we could see inside. You may recall that I found this in the room earlier, which I believe offers a solution. Oh, the rope! To reach the intended destination, what better tool than this rope? Mr. Sholmes has managed to bring the deduction back to the rope! All right, I have to admit, that was clever. So we just throw the rope up to the balloon and then pull it down to us on the ground? Which is much easier said than done, I feel. And could take us a very long time as well. True, perhaps we need a more surefire method. In fact, we already have one, of course, don't we? Take that! To reach the intended destination, what better tool than this crossbow? This was found at the scene, in fact. And, in all likelihood, belongs to Mr. Drebber. If the, if the man had only brought it away with him that day, he could have avoided losing a shoe at such a critical time as this. I'm not the point, but okay. So, shall we? Your curiosity is deeply stirred, no doubt, my dear fellows. What is the what is it that Enoch Drebber has hidden inside that balloon? The head. Indeed it is. A waxwork head inside a metal mask. A mask that is shut tight and fastened with a strong and quite impenetrable look. So we can't see the face inside, that means... Just a moment, this is the head of a waxwork model? Does that mean... Oh goodness! I see you've joined the dots, Mrs. Otto. Excellent. A headless waxwork model, the case of the abducted Madame Tuspel's model that you've largely solved. It was the only it was only the head of the killer that went so that was still missing. Indeed, it was. But I believe Madame Tuspel's will now have to settle her sizable account with me. This, as you have now surmised, is the head of the infamous professor. Yes, but why is it here? This conclusively confirms my suspicions. The man responsible for stealing the professor from Madame Tuspel's and returning it, sans tet, earlier yesterday, was none other than Enoch Drebber. This is incredible. Professor Harebrain's case and the waxwork abduction are, they're inextricably linked by Enoch Drebber's workshop. Well, it appears our logical pleasure, Cruz, has come to an end, my dear fellows. All that remains is, yes, to speak with the architect of this adventure. The architect? You mean Mr. Drebber? Ah, it says it seems quite possible that he escaped via one of the skylights. Obviously, the man must still be the he here in the room. What? And his location should be abundantly clear. If you simply reflect on the journey we've made together during this deduction, Enoch Drebber is right here. 
somewhere in this room. So, Mr. Dorado, will you do the honors? Ah, oh, yes, of course. Mr. Drebber's hiding place must be... It's the wardrobe. It's definitely the wardrobe. Actually, oh, they don't let you say it's the time device. It's the bomb. It's the wardrobe. Gosh, guys, have you ever seen Narnia? It's the wardrobe. Take that! <laughs> All right, Mr. Drebber, come out! Not then, Mr. Narhudo. But I don't understand. You can always climb inside yourself. Please, don't mind us. Do go ahead. I know how fond you are of wardrobes. Oh, he brought it up. Okay, bitch. I'll think of something else. Thank you very much. All right, now that I did the silly answer. Ah. Uh, I had to. Come on. Do you blame me? Take that! Before we gained access to this back room, we heard noises from in here. Which tells us that the engineer was still in the building at that point in time. He was in fact searching for the combination to his safe. And pressed for time, made no attempt to write the furniture that he overturned in the process. From which he can deduce that his search for the, for the combination happened very recently indeed. In summary, Mr. Enoch Drebber. Oh boy is at the very moment inside the safe. Ah, yeah. Thus concludes Herlock Sholmes' great deduction of this topsy-turvy puzzle. Beautiful. Beautiful. Elementary. So, Mr. Narhudo, I think perhaps it's time we ended this game of hide-and-seek, don't you? By opening the safe, you mean? What else? Ah, let's see. The combination was one, four, three, two, five, eight, eight two. I knew that. All right, then. Here goes. You found me. What the fuck? Gregson has been sitting here listening to this whole thing. How, on a scale of like one to ten, how much do you think Gregson is fed up with our shit? Ten being really fed up. Because I think I would put it at like a solid eleven. <laughs> Drebber, I presume. Correct. You better start talking. You tricked Professor Hairbrain with that bogus machine you built. 
And you shall have to explain the theft of the waxwork with from Madame Tuspels as well. Whilst I would be delighted to answer your many questions. Personally, I would advise that you deactivate my little parcel first. Deactivate? Your parcel? I refer, of course, to the time bomb. I left it at a, in a most prominent position. I see. Stunned silence. You're all going gearing up to die with me, then. Mr. Sholmes, with only seven seconds to spare? That was too close for comfort. I've got one foot in the grave already. Oh my fucking... <sighs> okay. Okay. And he's just chill. Like, he's just casual about this. Okay. Are you trying to get a help us get a killer or get us killed? Ugh. <sighs> Mr. Sholmes's deductions can be completely life-altering, can't they? Well, my dear fellows, that was a close shave. The resemblance to an anti-gravity device is really quite startling, I must say. Anti-gravity devices don't exist. Phew, I wouldn't push it, Mr. Sholmes. So, what happened here? I'm taking this hat off. We're done with the deduction of the century. What on earth happened here? You found me, haven't you? No need to screw me down any further. Everything in here is precisely what it seems. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be giving it a thorough going over, don't you worry, Trevor. What fails to click with me is how you were able to locate my sh workshop. That I was not expecting. When I heard whistling from the other room, I knew it was time to bolt. Whistling? Ah, that would have been me. Oh! For some reason, I woke in fine fettle today. In other words, uh, just tightly squeezed chips. Clearly, I must have a screw loose. Though, as I couldn't remember the combination for the safe, and another one loose, as I couldn't remember on which piece of furniture I'd write it down. We also found a rope over by the wall. I hate his smile. Ew, look at his smile, though. Is that not some of the most, like, unsettling shit you've ever seen? Jesus. This guy just, like, screams evil in every way, shape, and form, and it just makes you so uncomfortable. I am not okay. <laughs> He's creepy as fuck. Oh, yes, I had hoped to exit through the skylight, but sadly, the rope was too short. So, I then set about searching for the combination code to open the safe. And burning through incri the incriminating blueprints, don't, f don't forget. Regrettably, though, you failed to retrieve the head from the balloon among the rafters. And after that, you hid yourself in the safe? Having first set this parcel ticking. Well, I had no intention of being nailed by the police. Yes, of course. Go 
got a death wish, have you? I'm right behind, beside a ticking time bomb. I need to eat soon. Well, why do you suppose I chose to hide inside the safe? It's no ordinary safe. It's specially designed. A dynamite explosion wouldn't leave a scratch on it. So, in fact, the safe was the only safe place. Ugh. Precisely. But once you've climbed inside, you wouldn't have been able to get out again. I invite you to look more closely. The safe is fitted with a handle on the inside to allow the door to be unlocked from within. Ah, so it is. I had always intended to blow this place to smithers in any case. I just wasn't expecting uninvited guests to come along and screw up my plans. Do you- do you mean to say you were planning to blow us all up? No, no. That was unforeseen. What do you mean? Most people run, you see, when they see a ticking time bomb at their feet. Ah! I calculated the time required for retreat to a safe distance and set the device accordingly. But your seemingly endless discourse in here threw a spanner in the works. Is something wrong, Gregson? Bro, this actually just keeps getting better. <laughs> Do I have something on my face? Besides the usual eyes, ears, nose, and mouth? <laughs> I think we have a fairly good idea of what's been going on around here now. But what about the two incidents that you've evidently been involved in recently? Professor Harebrain's instantaneous kinesis experiment at the Great Exhibition and the waxwork model that you stole, which this head belongs to? That's no ordinary head, you know. That's the head of the professor. Clad in a mask with a lock to so strong, I'm unable to open it safely to reveal the killer's identity. I've been considering carrying it around as protection. After all, that's enough! Oh. How did sh Oh, the forensics is here. Shit. What's going on here, Gregson? I'm sure you're aware that I have sole jurisdiction to investigate here? Um, yes, well... Dr. Sid again. So the forensic uh, investigation team are here. Doesn't that also mean uh, that Von Zeeks is here too? Just saying. Okay. And you know full well this engineer is a key witness. Why are you allowing this lawyer access to him? If Lord Strongheart knew of this, you'd be finished. You lot, leave at once. My dear madam, there's no need for such a threatening tone, I assure you. After all, there's no way to greet an old acquaintance, is it, Dr. Sith? Hello, Sholmes. Ah, Mr. Sholmes knows Dr. Sith. Doc- Okay, let me get this straight, Ryanosuke, you dumbass. Mr. Sholmes knows everybody. That's important. Get it in your brain. If someone is important, he knows them. It's plain and simple. He knows everybody! Okay? It shouldn't be a shock. If it's protecting the machine next door that's causing such a sour expression on your face, you are quite misguided. It's really nothing more than a shell. Get out. Oh, but of course, we'll show ourselves the door. I see you haven't softened at all. Mr. Naruto? Yeah? It would appear that our delightful entertaining investigations have run their course for today. But Mr. Sholmes, let us leave this place in the doctor's capable hands. I said get out now, all of you! 
Your presence here is not required either, Gregson. Understood. But I'll just say one thing before I head off. It wasn't for this lawyer and his companions, we'd never have found this place, and the whole workshop would have been blown to bits. There was a time bomb set in here that this lot disarmed. Inspector! <laughs> Something giving you a chuckle, has it? Trevor? So sorry. Didn't mean to offend. You're quite right, of course. You did disarm the time bomb, didn't you? Yes, you did disarm that one. What are you? That one? You mean... No. No. Oh, okay. Oh. I thought Gina was about to die, man. Oh, my heart sank so fast. It was an hour later that we heard the news of the enormous explosion that ripped through the experimentation stage at the Great Exhibition. <sighs> Professor Harebrain's invention and all of its secrets were blown away forever. <sighs> to be continued, oh my god. Oh, I thought they were gonna kill Gina and I just like, my heart. My heart sank so fast. Wait, do I keep going? Oh god, I'm really hungry. Do we keep going? Oh god, what do I do? What do I do? Oh, I'm so addicted. I'm so addicted. Tomorrow I play Divinity, chat. Maybe, maybe I play a little bit of this game after playing Divinity, or I just actually take today, tomorrow off of Great Ace Eternia all together and cry because I'm not playing the game. Oh god, what do I do? Do I keep going? Uh... Oh no, I don't know what to do! I want to play so bad! Alright, I gotta- I gotta do like a Rianosuke. Okay. Alright, Crystal. Given together all of the facts, we know that Crystal is severely addicted to this game and wants to keep playing. However, evidence suggests that doing long streams is really bad for the voice, as we can see in previous streams. So that means that as a result, I should no longer continue this stream so that I don't become the victim of a m murder via uh, Twitch killing me because I need to stream every day and every hour. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly, I should take a break. <laughs> Does that sound good? <laughs> oh my god, I'm so addicted. This is so fun. Okay, I will say this now. Tomorrow is a Divinity stream with my friends. However, if for some reason it doesn't happen, I will be playing this game. And if the stream ends early, like if we, are, if we only do like three hours of Divinity tomorrow, there's a good chance I might just switch gameplay and uh, play Great Ace Attorney for the rest of this stream. I don't know. 
But regardless, I'll be back on Friday. Tomorrow, I'm just warning you guys, I might play after Divinity. I'm just... It's hard to say. I'm just really addicted. It's so bad. I love this game so much. It sucks so bad. Why am I so addicted? My heart. My heart is so addicted to this game, guys. It's so bad. All I want to do is play.